Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of uh, the fifth edition of Shaping the City Forum for Sustainable Cities and uh, Communities from Palazzo Michiel at the European Cultural Center. Uh, today, we have the pleasure to proceed with session number three, four, and five. Uh, but to um, kick off the day, we would like to show you a brief video about the exhibition Time Space Existence that is now at uh, Palazzo Bembo, Palazzo, uh, Palazzo Bembo, Palazzo Moro, sorry, and the Marina Ressa Gardens, and it's going to close tomorrow. So if you had no chance to see the exhibition, we invite you to, to go and see it. Um, and um, why it's so important? It's important because shaping the city is part of the public program uh, of time space ex existence. And uh, most of the faces and the project that we are going to see uh, today, they're also exhibited in the exhibition. So let's have a look at this video. Every two years, the world stops and says, how are we projecting the future of our profession in its relationship to the world? We're trying to present the laboratory for the future of urbanism, but also the kind of work that we are doing on cities, data and design, community engagement and experts, as being experiments towards a better future of cities. Housing is much more than the obvious. It can play different kinds of roles. We picked a problem that actually helped define a typology that we could use many places. I thought architecture had to have color, more color, more vibration. I was very interested in architecture always, but after World War II, it became very boring. I discovered Salomonic columns and arches and domes. My work is it's making fun of architecture, especially of old architecture. Before, nobody would have built this. Now maybe they would build it. created an installation that we call Counterbalance that is essentially what we think of as a collective furnishing. We wanted something that people were immediately drawn to and that they wanted to touch and that they wanted to interact with. And we were introduced by the ECC to the fabricators here in Italy. They helped us find a regional material. And that's something we're thinking about in all of our projects. Where are materials being sourced? How are they moving? to get to the site, how do we emphasize minimizing waste. The name of our exhibition is Essential Homes Research Project. It's aimed at starting the debate over temporality in settlements, in the case for humanitarian and other type of, of crises. We aim to provide a solution that is more permanent, more durable, that protects inhabitants with a low CO2 emissions with an affordable solution. The Essential Homes Research Project is located at Giardini della Marina Ressa. We have a room at Palazzo Mora in which we also depict the context. We research photographic uh, representations of different approaches to essential homes. With We have also supporting drawings, physical models, samples of the material we've been using, and also big images of how can it be used for communities. I think it's crucial that you imagine for who you are designing and for who you're making a home. We should also think much more in a collective way. It's not just a single home, it's also the collective of many homes together. I could learn a lot from other countries, how they do their affordable housing. Venice is extremely important where we meet. It's important to show it to the audience, to come up with ideas, to give politicians or developers ideas, give them inspiration. But it's also very much for the architecture community ourselves that we inspire each other and that we learn from each other. So all come to Venice, to the European Cultural Center. There's an enormous amount of exhibitions and it gives you a lot of inspiration. Biennales are a cross-section of the future. Venice is the primary place for architects to come together to have discussions, debate and deliberation. It's really worthwhile, honestly, because a lot of smart people come here. People one knows in the whole world, they're here wanting to see the work. It's a place where people meet.
and enjoy each other. So this was the brief about Time Space Existence Exhibition uh, that is, as Lucia mentioned, up and running until tomorrow. So yeah, make sure to check it out. Um, today we have three uh, sessions during this morning and in the afternoon. So the session of the morning is titled Digital Building Technologies. In the afternoon we're going to kick off um, uh, the session um, with a panel discussion between Kengo Kuma, uh, the Japanese architect, with uh, Boton Bognar and Badaj Bognar, who is uh, one of the partners of Kengo Kuma and a professor from Illinois uh, University. And the final panel and discussion is titled The Future of Architecture Media with the editor-in-chief of Thomas Magazine and the managing editor of Arc Daily. So yes, please do stay with us for the entire afternoon. For this morning, we are kicking off this recurring theme of shaping the city titled Digital Building Technologies and explores the possibilities of new sustainable materials and vernacular construction solutions. It demonstrates the latest trends and development in architecture technology. So the new advancements and these developments will highlight the conscious choices about alternative construction methods and digital techniques that reduce the impact on our environment and reduce our carbon footprint. So leaders in this field will be sharing about cutting edge approaches that are revo uh, revolutionizing the industry. Without further ado, I give it to Lucia to introduce Alicia, our moderator. So the session is launched and moderated by Alicia Naman Vasquez. Alicia is an architect with a passion for robotics and digital fabrication, a strong believer that robotics can augment rather than replace human craft, and that human-robot collaboration is the future of the construction industry. Her work focuses on exploring design through integrating materials, local skills, and cutting-edge design with digital fabrication technologies, such as machine learning and robotics, in relation to the context-specific environments. As an academic and an entrepreneur, Alicia is the founder of the Circular Factory and MI Toolbox. Um, Alicia is also an associate professor at the University of Calgary, where she also co-directs the Laboratory for Integrative Design. So, um, Alicia, the floor is yours. And I remind uh, the, um, the audience connected to uh, the YouTube channel that they can uh, drop questions in the chat that is moderated by our colleague Elena. So, we invite you to do so. Okay, so, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for the for the invitation. It is a pleasure to be talking here today about some of the work that we have been doing on the um, on the last 15 years and uh, what do we believe is um, shaping the city or how can we contribute on the, what what uh, believe on the digital fabrication and um, yeah. So um, I'm a, I'm an architect. I have been working and I have been uh, fortunate to be working into a lot of like. Um, the applications of a, a technology of, of a digital fabrication and all digital design tools to see how can we integrate them with like uh, different modes of, of building or of craft. Um, and uh, through, throughout uh, this time, I have been uh, fortunate to be uh, f to be able to build a lot of different um, pavilions to demonstrate some of these tools and techniques um, throughout the times. Uh, also, uh, from the last. Uh, kind of 12 years I have also started to work in like uh, robotics and uh, digital fabrication to see how can we um, help to use the machines to kind of translate or to help us work in a lot of these uh, novel geometries, how can we help to translate that digital to physical realization, which I think was always um, kind of a very important part of the work and, and more in the context of like uh, emergent um, economies or like local contexts. So um, we started on this journey like a long time ago, like in uh, 2011 when I was uh, teaching at the AA. And we like really uh, started to look at the different solutions. This was like our little robot. But I think that the strong belief that came to this time was that if we really kind of uh, merge this intersection of uh, robots with, with principles of architectural geometry and of design that allow us, allow us to be more efficient and uh, have more sustainable um, geometries that will be by nature um, 
less, uh, will be using less resources and will also have a longer lifespan. And we can merge this with the construction trades and with traditional construction knowledge. Then we, we will be able to build and design uh, structures that will be better for the cities, that will be more inclusive, and that will be able to bring everyone into this new um, technological world. So that was like uh, the belief and, uh, and something that we started to work for for a very long time. And how can we bring new talent, but also not only talk about a crisis and about a city crisis, but actually how can we bring everyone involved in the process, all the stakeholders, into new ways of building and, and shaping our city. Uh, Something that we really um, st like, uh, and I think that there was a lot of, of work in, into like, uh, that I started to really focus on is how can we m move from technology into, into bringing it to, to like a lower scale, into like actually making it more accessible uh, for, 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 uh, for the trades and for SMEs and for people that are on the building industry. So I started to focus a lot more into um, kind of robotic fabrication and the robots as a flexible machine that could have multiple uses. And the big benefit um, that we could see on these in, in, in the work was that that when, when, when we think about how new construction or like new ways of building are made which are more related to manufacturing, we can see that the small contractors cannot have access to them. So, so that's where I kind of started to really become interested in how can we make these new processes that are super interesting, fascinating, can we make them, um, can we bring them to, to the 98% of the construction industry, which, which we will say currently they won't have access to these ways of building, but, but they, are more, they are limited by other, um, by traditional tools. And something that also kind of started to become uh, very, um, very present was the fact that when construction becomes manufacturing, um, or when we think about all of the new industry, and when, and when it is, um, it, it, when it goes from the from this on site to the off site to a factory, uh, the talent is different. So the people that work in a factory shop are not the same people that has construction skills or trades skills. So there, so they, so this cannot be translated. You need to 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 have people that has totally different skills, which also means that you are losing a lot of the skills on the on the on site construction and on people that 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 have been doing in this trade for, for, for years, right? So you are, we, are, we are losing a lot of knowledge. We need to train in new knowledge and we don't have access to these tools for 98% for of the industry. And, um, when, and when we talk about how do we implement digital construction methods, it's not, uh, it's not so easy because to start a digital construction tends to be more expensive. You need, large, you need a large capital investment upfront to have these very large machines that, w that make amazing things and to also have that, the large spaces uh, where you host the machines and also um, to have the knowledge of how do we use these machines. So it does require a really flip or a really big change on how we approach um, how we approach construction and how we approach the different stakeholders that will be involved in the process. Uh, so, so how can we make these uh, robots and construction more accessible and, and bring them to to the same trades and to the same uh, and to kind of not bring them but upskill the trades so that they can also become part of this digitized economy and they can also be part of them. So one of the, of the first things that I started uh, looking off and I really started to fascinate me was how can we move from um, design from, man from manufacturing and assembly or DFMA, which is like the paradigm that started from the 80s and like in, in, in construction to, to move more into like uh, robo factoring or into actually remove the big machines and put more of these tasks on a robot cell, on the robot arm, so that we can have a, mach a machine that by principle is cheaper and is more flexible to do more of the tasks that are high quality and that also is more transportable. It's easier to move, it's easier to bring everywhere and also uh, we can have local people using them and in principle has a, a, a much lower entry level cost. And, and then uh, with, with the large, um, like all of the movement on like mass timber, uh, we kind of also thought, well, can we move from, from mass timber, which, which does in potentially move these construction workers to manufacturing workers into digital timber, or what I like to call digital timber, where we actually 
introduced uh, the, the digital tools to already easily assimilate, uh, to assimilate workflows on, on site. And we can also, instead of be, uh, having the cost of transporting the volumetric pieces, we can just bring the robots on site, assimilate them with existing workflows, assimilate them with existing platforms, and uh, kind of avoid all the importation duties and delays. And I think that um, during the last two years, with like the uh, COVID, what became very apparent to a lot of the people I was talking with is like, well, we did have a big disruption on supply chains, a big disruption on transport. So bringing all of these big volumetric pieces became very complex just to think about shipping them around the world. So, so it kind of, it was when the, when the idea really kind of, I think, we started to become more able to, to make it happen. Because then it, it just became apparent that if we bring the machines and we assimilate them with the workflow, we, we don't have to bring them a hundred times, but it's only one time and then we just fabricate on site. And, um, and then I, I love this quote uh, by Francis Kerr, which is like, uh, the more local materials you use, the better you can promote the local economy and build local knowledge, which also makes people proud. And I think that this is something that I, I find very fascinating, especially on my work um, in construction, is how um, construction workers can be very proud of what they do. And, and that is something that unfortunately is getting lost. Like currently, in a lot of economies, construction workers are not proud of what they do. They, it's just like kind of the, the most basic job if they cannot do anything else in life. Whereas that's not the case in the past. And in some countries, it is still the case that people that are like masons or welders, or, or they, they, do, they do know that this is a trade that has an, a long, a long uh, process of apprenticeship. They are very proud of what they do. So with that in terms, we started to... Oh, how do I go back? Sorry. Well, sorry, this, this is a video, but it's not uh, playing. Can we press play? No. Um, well, um, it's fine. I will. Uh, so, so like, um, how can we like leverage all these technologies to kind of establish this uh, decentralized supply chain, which are we have with a focus on a on flexible localized assembly, and and we kind of started to think about this idea of the circular factory, uh, and to 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 leverage this technology to have very sophisticated and dynamic, customizable process on site. So we kind of started to think about, okay, what will be the best use to adapt with like, um, with like, don't change everything and say like now everything will be done by robots in a total new way, but how can we just adapt some little pieces uh, with existing methods and just like change part of the of the of the design and fabrication process where we can actually make an impact while trying to adapt which uh, where we which the way that things are already built. So we started to conceptualize what will be the, the minimal footprint that we need to make a factory. So we did a lot of work into uh, designing this factory, where do materials come from, where do they go, how are they processed, and the more important thing was having the minimal amount of machines that can make most of the work and making those machines to be robots so that they could be cheap and flexible. I mean, in comparison with like maybe five axis CNC machines or other machines, they, they are a lot more um, affordable. So we work into uh, um, so we so we work into the design iterations to try to get to like the minimal footprint like uh, maybe like that, that uh, 250 300 square meters to really be, and enable to produce a large amount of products. And then we also at the same time one of the biggest problems that I have found on like a lot of the uh, of the uh, digital fabrication robotic fabrication methods is the, the digital workflows like it's like everyone has our own customized scripts own customized language how do we actually make it accessible that is that you can only print a, like have a very easy workflow that not only engage the trades but also engage the designers and the the, the, the clients the real estate developers everyone on the stakeholder every other the stakeholder um, process can be part of it. So we started to work on a digital, uh, this, on a digital design to production workflow, um, trying to have everyone um, uh, information for everyone, and also to have a, a workflow on the shop that could allow, like, to go from the, to design to production with like the least amount of having to change scripts and models and languages and all of this, so that everyone in the in the shop floor can also have access to this information very easily for the production. 
Um, so we create. So we started to design our, our own platform for for this digital design workflow uh, with designers, uh, fabricators, the assembly, and finally the management on site of the construction um, to to, be, to have access to the pieces. Something very important and that came from very early on in the process was to have like a hierarchy, a hierarchical composition of objects. So what objects actually require from digital methods? Which objects can just be done by traditional timber framers, by traditional construction people? Which objects we are going to be more focused on? And then how will this information process be translated to everyone on, uh, on the site and which, which machines require, are, are required for each of these processes. So for every part, we knew which machines are going to be used and how this is going to be distributed and communicated to everyone involved. Uh, a big opportunity came with this project. This is a project that built in a, on an island, on a very remote island in the Caribbean called Rattan by Zahadid project. So they, so um, I, I have been working with uh, doing a, a, some pavilions for Zaha in the past. So, so it was an, in Mexico and like in in, um, in India, these kind of economies. So I was uh, so we started to think about okay, can we build it on site without having to transport all of these uh, complex geometries and beautiful pieces, maybe from Germany or from the U.S. to the island and can we bring the robots? So this was a great opportunity to, to test if this could actually happen. Uh, one of the complexities of this project is that um, the way that they have designed it is that um, people can customize their unit in any which way they want. So basically we did have to make the factory or the production facility to, to be able to adapt to all of this different flexibility and to all of these different components, sizes, dimensions, uh, with minimal um, changes, so that it could, so that if uh, if if the design ends up being kind of some of any of these options, we could make it on site. And so we started to also kind of look at all the different pieces that require are required for this project. What is the assembly logics and how how will how what are the elements that they are made of? And with all of this in mind, we kind of. Um, Let's see if this works. Yeah. We kind of have like um, a process where, like each piece that the architects kind of give to us, we can um, we are we are looking at how will we make it. What are the, the different um, um, machines and the, the different steps? How will it be split? How will it be um, like made into small components that can then allow us to fabricate it to make it to to make it? So, like for example, a lot of these pieces, all of this is made using local Honduran pine, which is um, the timber or the or the kind of of, of product that was available locally and um, all, of, all of them um, kind of we get a split they get divided and then they get again uh, put together again um, so so we have all of these in a, we, we have been working on developing this platform with the idea that we can provide uh, all of this information to the designer also to the to the to the persons that are involved on the uh, like the, the humans that are designing or deciding how they want their unit to be, which are maybe potential um, people, but but like a lot of people that are involved on this, on, on this process, and uh, and and they also can see uh, we are we are we are really aiming to make all of this information as transparent as possible, so that uh, so that when when you are like normally like a client or like a manufacturer, you don't know what the piece is going on, what is going on with your project, when will you have it. Etc. So we are. So what we are kind of trying to do on developing this platform is on having that transparency of what is the materials required, the bill of materials, but also all of the different machines and processes that the piece has to go through, and uh, and all of the different skills and traits that I will require. So you can have from uh, from the designers, they could have this uh, knowledge of okay, how they change the geometry, how does that impact the fabrication, and also the clients that are configuring or designing their units, they could also access the information of how do the different pieces I select change the, the amount of materials that I need, the amount of machines that will be required, the fabrication times, and so you can I, maybe start to make informed decisions about how your, your ideas will affect actually uh, the process, not only on time, but also on sustainability and amount of materials and, and on how, how is it required. So we started with all of this in mind to like kind of really engage into um, making these. Like we got a, a few. We have two robots. We had a truck, and then all of the other machines that are normally. We work on scheduling all of these so that um, so that also the workers, the local workers, which which we are um, training into using all of the machines, can also know at every step they just have tablets and they can know what what they have to do, what is the process, how much material they need, how they need to lay it down, how do they need to 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 stack it, so they can also get access to all of these. And uh, 
And then here is like the process. So how, how percentage is done, how is it advancing, how much, how much is missing, if there is a mistake. All of these, they can also be logging in real time. And then this, this information becomes, again, accessible downward and forward on the, on, on the chain, like uh, for, for everyone there. And, and uh, this is like, um, yeah, like, uh, like the different the schedules where like the, the, the workers or, or, the, or everyone in the production facility like uh, on the shop can know what, what is going on in every machine and what, what is the different steps that are required for each piece. So with all of these, we kind of, uh, we bring the machines. It was a very scary process, to be honest, when you think about an island in the middle of nowhere and then suddenly it's exciting, there is the Caribbean, but then suddenly when you, when you are bringing these machines and, and they are like, like the roads are not paved and etc. It does become very challenging. So, so it was, uh, but it, it was fun also. And uh, oh, sorry. So this was our our truck kind of coming down of the truck. I was I was really terrified at this moment in my life. Um, well, this is not running, but it's okay. Oh, sorry. And and this is like uh, the, the facility that we finally built. Um, we have a uh, we are, we are, we are um, kind of training a people there. We have like the the, the, the trucks. We have the robots, uh, which are doing most of the processes: the milling, assembling, cutting. Uh, and we humans are doing also like the assembling. Um, but most of the processes are focused on these two guys there. We also have other like normal shop machines, maybe CNCs, and another like a small um, a small shop machines. So all of these in, on the island, and we have a lot of local people right now. And it's very um, very cool to see them. How excited they get! How enthusiastic they are! We have got, like lots of people coming to the shop. They they are they are always trying to jog the robots to learn, which is kind of people that maybe we don't normally are thinking, right? And and a lot of them, what is for me better is they are also already asking if they can take the facility if they can if i can make another one and they can keep this one which ideally will me will be will be fascinating if suddenly it just becomes part of the local community they they just they, they just they are just the owners of them so so that will be like an ideal kind of a scenario in the future um this is, we also try to do a lot of uh, some research projects. This is a project that we were working on over the summer uh, in collaboration with IAC into more of like uh, kind of using like robot lo like uh, logs and, and, and more like uh, not so much like a, a, a real project, but more into um, kind of using raw wood and also seeing with the local materials that are available, how can we use them and how can we also like take advantage of maybe other supply chains. Um, and then we also built uh, this project here that is on the Palazzo Mora, which is one of the parts of the Bellabu project so that we made as a prototype. Uh, so that's uh, when it was coming here in the summer, like, uh, or before the summer, I think, earlier this year. And I think it's there still. Uh, so this is one of those bull noses, uh, all of these on through the platform and just using the machines, uh, which I think is, um, is, is still at the Palazzo and, uh, and kind of the different steps of the different pieces. And I think that, that the, the main idea is how can we make this digital fabrication to be decentralized, distributed and democratic for everyone. So for me, the, one of my, or of my take on that is to, to make like this flexible, adaptable micro factory uh, develop a software that enables the stakeholder participation for designers, architects, the, the, the clients, but also for people on the shop. They can see all the processes, everything. Uh, they can see how things are going. And we're also working on a micro-credential program to upskill and, and train all of these, um, all of the labor. Um, and, and, and I think that how do we go from this? Uh, and we know that with the Industry 4.0 and the new um, the revolution, we are talking about moving from artisanal production to the from mass production to now customized on-site production. So how can we also make this accessible and uh, for for like everyone involved in the construction industry and 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 and, um, and, and more um, compatible? So. Yeah, thank you. That, that's, um, that's where we are at, and we are kind of working on that. So thank you very much. So um, yeah, I'm going to introduce the first next, uh, yeah, the speaker of the session. And I'm very happy to introduce um, uh, Professor Lucia Blandini, who um, is a professor, uh, Lucia Blandini is an engineer and an architect with a special interest for sustainable lightweight systems and the relationship between architecture, engineering, and digital technologies. He's also the head of the Institute for Lightweight Structures and Conceptual Design, ILEC, at the University of Stuttgart. And he's a deputy spokesman of the Collaborative Research Center 1244, Adaptive Skins and Structures for the Built Environment of Tomorrow. 
He's a lead PI within the cluster of excellence of integrative computational design and construction for architecture and works on the field, on the field of light concrete structures. Um, before coming back to the university in 2020, he spent several years in practice focusing on innovative facades and light structures wor worldwide, and he's currently a partner and managing director of Werner Zobeck AG. Thank you very much, and Lucio, I give you the mic. Yeah, thanks for the invitation and thanks for the introduction. I'm very happy to be back in Venice uh, after the inauguration. So, uh, and I need the pointer, yeah. Good. Um, so today I'm going to um, to present an introduction of the overall frame of research on lightweight uh, and sustainable systems, which uh, for the motivation for the one prototype that R and me have been uh, designing for uh, um, the Marina Ressa Garden. So let me start. First of all, with a research frame at the ELEC, at the university. Yeah. Sorry, my mistake. I didn't know that uh, this was a joint presentation. So we have um, Professor Lucio and Daria, who will be presenting together. Um, so uh, I will also like to introduce uh, Daria Kovaleva, who um, is an architect and PhD candidate at the Institute of Lightweight Structures for uh, Conceptual Design. and. Uh, She's a uh, PhD candidate at the Institute of Lightweight Design and Construction, ILEC, at the University of Stuttgart in Germany. After she graduated from the Moscow Architectural Institute, uh, she worked in various architectural offices, including uh, Werner Sobeck AG in Moscow and Stuttgart. And in 2014, um, she joined the ILEC team in the field of functionally graded concrete structures. In this context, she deals with lightweight construction with concrete, focusing on developing digital design methods and sustainable production concepts for resource-efficient concrete structures. As part of her PhD, she's developing a waste-free production process using recyclable sand uh, formworks. Uh, so, the, so actually, the, the, so now the talk uh, between uh, Professor Lucio and Daria. Yeah, thank you, I give it back. Okay, so um, I think now now it's more clear how we are going to structure our our presentation. I will provide, as I said, the research frame and the motivation, and in a way the kind of big picture we are um, after. Then, and this is this is what it's all about, right? It is about uh, reducing the amount of natural resources we are using in architecture in the uh, building industry. It is a lot about reducing the amount of CO2 emissions uh, which are originated by the building industry and what sometimes we forget about it is about reducing the amount of waste we generate out of the building industry. So uh, I think all of us are aware about these numbers. It's really scary that uh, our sector is in all of these three fields responsible for more of the half of the generation of uh, and consumption of resources and so our research is always looking into addressing all the three of these aspects so if any of them is not uh, part of the picture we just take one of the topics uh, of the research topics out of the uh, out of the screen in a way so this is just to understand what it is our motivation and in a way also to introduce why we do work with concrete and mineral materials just because they are so much used uh, in the building industry currently. So if we manage to, to change in a kind of disruptive way uh, the use that we do of, out of these materials, then we have an impact. And this is so actually all what it is about. And engaging digital technologies in design, engaging digital technologies in manufacturing is for us the kind of tool to get to this target and uh, and not the way the other way around and so this is important for us uh, and i think it's important to understand why we do certain things the way we do them and um, so alicia was uh, introducing the fact that i was involved for several years in the practice and this is a further motivation from my side uh, all the experience I've been gaining in the practice are now getting back into the academic research. And, uh, and I'm showing this project, which is for sure not a small one, but uh, brings um, kind of uh, an introduction about certain 
topics that I'm going and we are going to address. First of all, we do need infrastructure, we do need FATA buildings all around the world uh, in certain regions more than in others. And so it is not about saying we're not going to build further, but it's about the way, how are we going to build in the future so that we have a future-proof architecture. And um, in this airport we built in the Middle East, I was myself in charge of that uh, for five years, um, we've been looking for ways um, to build these uh, shell systems which are lightweight, so they make use of less structures with new technology that we, for instance, don't generate any waste out of it. Traditionally, we have such kind of shell systems with uh, special scaffolding, with special formwork, so that at the end of the day, we do have, again, a lot of CO2 emissions, a lot of material use, a lot of waste generated out of it. In this case, we have 37,000 panels, 6,000 different geometries, no waste out of the formwork, just because we use a, uh, a very sophisticated digital system in the design, but we also use a very sophisticated production system with adaptive formwork system. Only 80 pieces of them are used I'm not going to go in detail just because of the time, but it provides a bit of the motivation for our research work. And one of the other things that is uh, relevant to this project is all of that is prefabricated, all of that is prefabricated next to the construction site, so that means zero kilometer, and all of that is, uh, is pretty much automatized um, so that we get really, really effective. So we can use the material exactly where we need it. However, we still need for these kind of projects a lot of concrete, a lot of steel, and the question is, can we further reduce that? And this is uh, the idea behind one of the field of research, uh, reducing the amount of material, amount of concrete. Concrete in a, at the beginning is a fluid material, so it, we can get to, to a porous system, and that's something that is not be done sufficiently. So why don't we learn out of biological mineral system where um, the cells are organized along the, for, the, uh, the force paths so that we have material where we need it and we don't have it when, where we, not, uh, we don't need it. And so this is one of the inspiration, so we can take at least 40% of the material out if we really engage the potential of having porous systems. And we do have to engage this also on a material basis. Uh, so we are also, um, while we are working on porous system, we also consider using alternative mineral materials where we substitute, for instance, cement, which is responsible for a lot of CO2. 8% of the worldwide CO2 emission is coming from concrete and the concrete curing process. Uh, what about if we do engage uh, bioprocess with bacteria that do the work that cement is usually doing? And this is uh, what we are investigating since a couple of years with uh, the research field on bioconcrete, where, um, where the bacteria are generating the binding uh, capacity for the uh, for the sand and for the mineral in order not to have any CO2 emission. So in the moment where we manage to scale this up, we will have a CO2 free concrete or concrete substitution, which could be a big contribution to that. We do work also with uh, other kind of reinforcement, uh, basalt, mineral based, uh, but this goes too much behind behind the topic today. And uh, on a structural level, on a, on a bigger scale, we do think about ways how to uh, introduce hollow spheres made out of concrete. You see a project that we are currently designing at the university for university research, where we will have a hollow sphere made out of concrete. And now you can imagine what it is the, the contribution of digital tools. We have to decide how big the spheres are. We have to decide where they are placed. How is the layout? Uh, we have to uh, set up a kind of uh, loop and iterative process. And uh, you see a couple of uh, pictures below done out of the simulation. We have to demonstrate that uh, 
even if we have porous system, that the fire resistance capacity of this system is, is good enough. So the picture on the bottom down in the middle is, is a fire test. So it was not a problem to show 90 minutes fire resistance is okay for this kind of structure. And uh, I think that within 12 months, we will have the first worldwide um, holosphere graded concrete slab done in the world, done built in Stuttgart. So come and see it. Uh, I will tell more than next year about that. But it's just it's a kind of introduction. And, um, and here you can see, oh, I have to press, I believe that the video is running. Yeah. So now you can see how the technology is working. Um, so we have this holosphere which are, which are casted um, out of mortar and they just have one millimeter, two millimeter, they are very light. It's, uh, the, it's similar technology as you know from, from chocolate pralines. So everybody is a bit aware about how that could work. Now we can feel that and we can control with sophisticated digital tool and at the end wh why are we doing all of that you can see on the uh, on the top area a lot of this mass is void and that means we can take a lot out of it so we don't need to have massive concrete system we can have filigree concrete system this is what our research is about and uh, on the same time we do see that this complex uh, filigree system I have a need for a special formwork and uh, without generating any waste and so we do use sand as material for that we do use additive manufacturing to um, to make that possible and uh, this is uh, Daria PhD focus so I'm going to use this light to pass directly than the word to air and uh, she can explain more about the technology and how we use this technology for the Marina Ressa coral tree which is still exposed at the Marina Ressa gardens. Daria. Thank you Lucio. So yes, um, the core principle within this zero waste technology for uh, lightweight concrete structures when we're using sand and water soluble organic binder is the combination of 3D printing in the powder bed because this method enables us to produce the highly complex geometries without any waste but also the uh, material system composed of sand and water soluble organic binder dextrin which is usually a byproduct in the um, uh, production industry and um, the uh, dextrin is being activated by the uh, water when in, in the process of printing, as you can see here, and then together the mixture is dried with the infrared lights so that it's geometrically stable but can be easily washed away after concrete casting and demolding. So we're usually demolding our form, formworks with the usual tap water, and then the formwork can be split from the excess water, dried, ground, and put back into the cycle for the further production. In order to produce the full-scale structural components, we developed together with the Institute for Control Engineering at the University of Stuttgart, the 3D printer with a powder bed size of around Euro pellet. So let's say one meter long, 70 centimeters wide and 40 centimeters deep. And then we produce this formwork and uh, by, by water and then we activating um, the binder by the infrared light so that we could eliminate all the further production steps and then are ready it's all good yeah so that the formworks are ready um, <laughs> within the one <laughs> printer and we test So, and then we tested several components already on the small scale, including also what Lucio showed. But I would like to focus more on our first uh, large scale prototype that we were very happy and very lucky to design and build for the um, a Time Space Existence exhibition this year. And it still stands until tomorrow in Marinaresa Garden that we call a Marinaresa Coral Tree. So what for us was important to show actually how uh, lightweight construction can contribute to the decarbonization of the industry. Because we see lightweight construction as the cumulative approach to reach 
the, resor the re reduced resource consumption, but also, as Lucio said, reduce the emissions and reduce the waste. And these areas are actually mutually reinforcing and enabling each other. So we built our design based on these three facets or aspects of this lightweight construction. First, of course, is minimal, meaning that we are minimizing the material consumption by using structural optimization techniques that are available to us today. But also, the second is the circular production that is enabling the zero waste fabrication of such complicated structures without any waste generated in the production. And of course, these both first principles come to the third one, which we call a regenerative capacity of concrete structures. In general, concrete reabsorbs CO2 from the atmosphere. So the cement that is present in concrete, it gets it back and transforms into a calcium carbonate. So you will see also later in details that such complex filigree structures also could enable to maximize this capacity. We also, for our design, took a very simple and very traditional structural system, the transition from the flat slab to the column uh, through the capital. And first, we did the structural optimization to reduce the weight. So we gained 60% of the weight savings. And we also could provide all the necessary reinforcement by using fiber, tailor placed, and also the steel connectors to provide assembly and easy disassembly. And then, based on these geometries, we generated our sand form walks that we split and produced on the campus. So one by one, with our designed machine, we did, uh, we produced these 56 formworks. And what is important to mention is that the sand was already reused within one production cycle when we were doing the coral tree. Because we were producing the first segments and then we were recycling the formwork and loading it to the further production. So we had and no waste and we also had less material for formwork production in general. So I would like now to show a little bit more visuals and technical details on the movie that we prepared for you. Can we get just the sound a little bit louder? <laughs> but it's okay, doesn't matter. So generally, so we use our formworks that are geometrically stable. They can easily uh, sustain the hydrostatic pressure of concrete, but at the same time, they are readily water soluble. So the <laughs> And with, with, this, with this method, we could produce very complex structure that would not be possible to do any otherwise. So that became actually the background or the backbone for the design that we had when we uh, generated the very um, complex three-dimensional structure with the maximized stiffness that helped us to save the material. And at the same time, when you cast the concrete in the formwork, it enables you also to provide fully reinforced structures and integrate a lot of complex elements such as steel implants and the uh, um, distributors for the stress concentrations. Further, we used also the uh, raw materials as well as the recycled materials, as I mentioned earlier. And they could, the formwork material can be easily recycled within the campus facilities, so that's no problem. We did it also on, on our own, and then this material can be directly loaded for the further production. Here you can see one of these uh, uh, formwork segments that we did for the upper elements. That was printed with a resolution for around 1.2 millimeters in the course just of the several hours, so actually we could go with the production pretty fast. And what is also important that the formwork material doesn't shrink because it dries layer by layer, and we could assemble them and in, in to cast the bigger concrete components for more than one and a half meters in bright and, and length. And then we integrated, of course, all the necessary reinforcement and the connectors. In our casting procedures, we use self-compacting very liquid concrete that could fill all the cavities of such formworks. And already in the 24 hours, the formworks are ready for um, demolding, and they can be transported into the washing station where we could actually directly wash the formwork out with the tap water in the course of several minutes, as you can see here. Yeah, so at the end we have these uh, components that we produced. We have in total nine uh, modules that we were later packed and transported into Venice. And we also could assemble, yes, and we also could assemble the structure pretty fast, just in the course of one day. 
And we also had the really optimized, compared to our previous project, number of connections. So we had just the eight upper connections in between the segments and then the four connections to the capital and column. And when the uh, uh, scaffold was released, then we were um, already be able to um, explore the regenerative potential. So as I mentioned, generally mineral materials, they have the capacity to absorb CO2 from the atmosphere. So basically, calcium hydroxide that is present in hydrated cement is acting with the CO2 and is being transformed into a stable mineral of calcium carbonate and water. So why lightweight construction is important? Because by maximizing the surface area as this reaction propagates from the periphery inwards, it is possible to actually fully carbonate the structure. And also having reduced cross-sections and having also non-corrosive reinforcement, the carbonation should consider in the future from our point of view as a positive aspect because the concrete can completely offset CO2 emissions. This is what we believe in, and we are also currently doing our further research on accelerating this process so that it doesn't happen in the course of 100 years, but actually just in the course of a few hours, and we are currently building the accelerated carbonation chamber. So I guess that's all from us, if you want to add something, but yeah, very good. Thanks. So just just a quick remark on on top of it, um, what we find out is that uh, the quality, the text, uh, textile quality of this uh, of the system is very important. So we don't we have different scales of the architectural design, and you could see it. How uh, the fact that it is 3D printed, uh, it leaves a certain. Uh, texture, a certain textile uh, quality, surface quality, which captures the light in a in a nice way. So, uh, I was saying at the beginning, it is about porous system because of the performance. But I want to keep it for the end, the uh, the statement that it is not only about the performance; it's also about the aesthetic of uh, these kind of systems, because you can make visible how this porous system are not only working well, uh, but are also engaging people in a different way and bringing qualities, additional qualities. And of course, aesthetical qualities, architectural qualities is a part of sustainability. So this is something I think we should also keep in mind. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation, um, Lucian Dara. And, uh, for our next speaker, I'm going to introduce uh, Harold Kloft. Uh, Harold is a professor for structural design at the TU on the Braunschweig in Germany. As a co-founder of the engineering firm Office for Structural Design, he has a wide range of experience in the realization of non-standard structures. Together with his team at the Institute of Structural Design, he researches innovative digital manufacturing technologies for the construction sector. Uh, the interconnected understanding of materials, technology, structural design, and the manufacturing process forms the basis here, as well as circular thinking. Since 2020, Harold Kloft has been the spokesperson for the DFG Collaborative Research Center, TRRR277, Additive Manufacturing Construction, at the TU on Braunschweig and the TU Munich. Thank you, and uh, Harold. Thank you very much, Alicia, for the nice introduction. Thanks, Hardy, for being here and Sia. So I titled my lecture Renewing the Logic of Form, and uh, I tried to give a more holistic view on uh, the time where we are in construction. And uh, if you reflect, there are many things which are fascinating us on, this, on the city of Venice, but one for sure is the architecture. So. Uh, more or less everything here in the city is out of natural stone and so there is not the question about engineers and architects. Uh, this is material what we took out from the nature and what we had to bring into those fascinating shapes and forms. And the crucial thing on this is to understand the material. So uh, manual work uh, was uh, the basis and you have to understand the material and the tool and the material, they are unified. I think this is absolutely important 
And if you reflect now, jump into today's uh, construction environment, the typical city of Frankfurt, you see a lot of cranes here. So we work today on site, and like um, Daria and Lucio presented what is possible with concrete, but we don't see this in, in our, on our normal construction sites. What we see is um, the mass production on site, and um, so there is for sure not a unity of the material, of the potential, what we saw before, of concrete, and uh, what we get here uh, in construction today. And besides this, we have a lot of inefficient material usage by putting concrete in standard formwork. We also have a high environmental impact. We have low productivity. Uh, lack of skilled workers, but also uh, a lack of quality and safety at work. So altogether, uh, we need a change. And uh, Niklas Mark, uh, in his article related to the opening of the, uh, this year's Biennale, he wrote about the paradox of construction in the period of climate change. That means, uh, we saw also before we have all this pollution, emissions in the construction sector and also waste. But on the other side, we have still increasing world population and the climate change also is, uh, is there already. So we need infrastructures to protect ourselves. And so we have to continue, we have to build more in the future than now. But the question is, how can we build for more people with less resources and less emissions? If you look to other industries, for example, the, const the automotive sector, so then you see the first uh, patented uh, motorway, uh, Mercedes-Benz and a contemporary S-Class model, and there, there is no discussion about the progress, so it's, it's obvious. And if you reflect, then there is a continuous technological development, so the different stages in industrialization up to Industry 4.0, where we are today. And on the other side, if you look to construction, so this is uh, the Bau Academy in Berlin by Schinkel, and on the right side is a contemporary housing project in Frankfurt. So many would say the left one by Schickel is quite uh, aesthetically more, more interesting and is more promising. So there is no technological progress uh, on bias. Of course, we have these new uh, technical installations inside and insulation and so on. But from the architectural point of view, you don't see this progress. And if you look to the technologies on site. So on the left side, the standard forework was patented and developed uh, over 100 years ago. And still, this is the standard technology on construction site. So we already started also to transfer the ideas from the other industrial sectors to construction, but this one-to-one -one transfer of an industrial serial production didn't work. And so we had also the results of uh, monotonous neighborhoods, and this is why the material concrete also in the, in the social, in the society, has not this uh, good uh, rumor. And also in steel construction, if we reflect, so we have the standard steel profiles which are industrially produced, which of course, uh, at, as a profile itself, are optimized from the shape, uh, but how we use it in construction. Uh, so the structures itself are not optimized. Often it's more uh, geometric planning than really uh, efficient design. And so we are working now on new ideas how we can renew the logic of form that also what you presented so that we really minimize the material input and we combine and get back uh, the original feeling that the tooling, the technologies, the material and the design really form a unity. We see today there are a lot of digital technologies possible. So in the digital environment, to visualize our dreams is not a problem. So 
artificial intelligence gives us totally new ideas how the future could look like. But the main thing is we have to take the responsibility for manufacturing. So how we bring those ideas into reality, this is the main uh, challenge we have to do in the future. I started 20 years, more than 20 years ago in the office of Bollinger and Kroman uh, as a young engineer and uh, I came up in that time of reform architecture. And this was my, my first uh, time I came into, in, in touch with digital fabrication. And uh, so in that time we already had these nice ideas which you could do in the digital environment. And we started to to bring them into reality by transforming industrial products. So we were always on the search what kind of material we could bring into uh, those new shapes. And this was really an amazing time. I learned a lot and uh, I just give you a f small insight in the first um, uh, project which was done in the seamless digital workflow from design to, to, to uh, fabrication. And I'm happy to have Bernhard Franken here, the architect. So we came together in that project more than 20 years ago, got friends, and uh, so this is an experience which uh, up to today is, uh, we will never forget this, yeah. And uh, so it's always the same. So we had nice ideas and we were able to, to, to calculate. So, but this was not a question on calculation. The question was what kind of material could fit into the shapes. And here you see um, this uh, acrylic plates. Uh, they have defined measurements, defined thickness by the industry you get. And then you have to do your own puzzle. So we uh, had to more than 300 different uh, acrylic sheets, each different. So for each we had to do a CNC mold. Each we had to bring by uh, heating up into, into the mold. And finally, the original idea was to glue the pieces together. Uh, and uh, this was done uh, close to Innsbruck in Austria. And we wanted to fly this bubble over the Alps to Frankfurt, which at the end didn't work. But uh, we had the digital data. And uh, so we translated uh, a primary structure out of aluminum. And at the end, it was really successfully. And only with this experience it was possible to do a few years later the Kunsthaus in Graz, which is now 20 years uh, ago and still an architectural milestone, uh, I think, of this period. It's a fantastic building, but we had to learn that this is, was not the future. It was not the future to use industrial products and customize them, individualize them for just for one project, much to cost-intensive, too much waste, and this is why those kinds of architecture couldn't uh, survive. So what is the future direction? The future direction we are convinced of additive manufacturing. Additive manufacturing in construction is a new technology we are researching on, and it combines automation in the process, but individualization in the outcome. So this is exactly what construction needs. And uh, you can see here the difference, just columns. So the left side is a, is a, a, column, a column, a concreted column with formwork, a lot of formwork, you, complex formwork you need. On the right side is uh, a column by natural stone. And both are dealing with masses. So the natural stone, you have to take out the mass from the nature, and in subtractive manufacturing, you have to design or bring this mass into shape. And the same with the left side, cubic meters and tons of concrete you pour in a formwork, so all also you deal just with the mass. But 3D printing in the middle, is, I don't know if it is working again, uh, no. um, is different. Why is different? Because you start not to, to arrange masses, you start to, to print. So you print a line and you have to do before you print a path planning. So this is a mind gap. Before you print a line, you have to think 
what kind of line, what is really needed. You never come up to the idea to print a massive column like it is done in natural stone in the subtractive manufacturing and like, like, like it is done in a, in a poured concrete con uh, column. You just need a ring. So you print a ring and uh, so you have by just by this small mind gap you reduce the material you, 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 which is needed by 50% and also gives you the additional uh, possibility to add functions. So you could also bring into um, post-tension elements for design for deconstruction, so to deconstruct the concrete uh, column later on, which is not possible with the pure concrete. So it's a totally different world of thinking which opens um, by additive manufacturing. And we are happy uh, two days before we get the prolong, uh, to prolong the project for another four years. Uh, with the TU Munich and TU Braunschweig, we are in a collaborative research center, and we develop new technologies from different materials, concrete, steel, uh, um, earth material, and also fibers in additive manufacturing processes. But the all-over idea is not just to substitute one technology, handcraft, manual technologies, by new technologies. It's much more to see it in a complete digital workflow. That means also the design for additive manufacturing is different. And so this is why we have this combination of more than 29 project, uh, researchers uh, in 80, 18 uh, interdisciplinary projects. So in the middle, you see the A material and uh, process uh, environment, but also design and construction and computational modeling are closely related to get totally new ideas. Yeah, and in Braunschweig, the basis for running such uh, collaborative research centers are, of course, on one side the people, but on the other side also the research facilities. So we have the Digital Building Fabrication Laboratory, DB, DBFL, which we constructed in 2016 already, and now uh, brand new, the digital construction site, a huge cobalt robot and mobile robots where we do this um, research on-site under environmental conditions. And here you get some impressions um, about uh, the DBFL. So reinforcement, of course, is an important topic, concrete without reinforcement. Uh, you can curve, of course, uh, single or double curve, but also the surface articulation, what you mentioned, Lucio, is, uh, is, is um, a topic for some projects. You, you keep this wave-like character, for others you want to have a smooth surface, so we have also technologies to smoothen the surface. So we focused in the last years on large-scale one-to-one building components and uh, you see here columns, walls, uh, lightweight structures, also ripped ceilings. Um, and the reinforcement, uh, this is, I don't know, this is turn around, okay. Um, so we also, this is also interesting, you know, when you have uh, 3D printing, immediately after printing, you can work with the fresh green state concrete. If you use a formwork, you have to wait, and when you remove the formwork, the concrete is hardened. Here the concrete is fresh, so you can also screw inside reinforcement after printing. And we have this, those two tracks um, that we have this combined digital processes for concrete printing and reinforcement uh, implementation. So either you prefabricate the reinforcement, so then the reinforcement supports the concrete you spray on, or the opposite direction, you first print the concrete and then it supports the reinforcement. So you don't need additional supporting reinforcement for which you need in normal concrete construction. Of course the force flow, uh, uh, the optimized force flow uh, um, design for still for a single beam uh, is efficient, and here you have to plan um, the concrete path is uh, along the reinforcement path. Is, so this is what you can do in the combination with computational design, of course. 
But what is now really in the next phase more challenging for us is uh, the larger scale. So when you see here, I took this image a few days before in Venice and in Giudecca. So these trade lines and coastal protection, so there is not a w windy day, but by just adding mass as resistance against uh, the water, it starts to, to weave. And so this is not the natural shape to resist. And uh, with computational design, we, we do, we can analyze. We also the depth in the water is uh, very important uh, about the, the height of the reefs. And so we're thinking on totally new design for coastal protection. protection. So we want to absorb the energy by the form. This is a new thinking, renew the logic of form, not just resist by mass, but much more to do computational design and try to absorb as much energy as possible just by the shape. And then you could also use created materiality uh, uh, to take the rest, to absorb the rest of the energy. So also has not to be one homogeneous material over the whole uh, length. Um, and so this is where we focus on here. And then also use different materials in additive manufacturing. So concrete is really CO2 intense. So that means try really to minimize uh, the concrete uh, use. But if you deal with earth material, this is the opposite. The material, the CO2 footprint of, of earth material is nothing. So then you need not you, but you don't need to bring this in that shape, so you could also do straight walls. And here is for robotic rammed earth, uh, a new idea which we could use in housing, because in housing maybe we don't need this kind of shape walls, uh, which we need, for example, in coastal protection, uh, protection. So, and then other technologies we have exhibited here in Palazzo Mora, the injection 3D concrete printing. So concrete is not just a material to, to bring into surface shapes. No, we uh, print concrete in a fluid with the same density and then immediately after the matrix come out of the nozzle, it gets stable and holds its position. And when it's get hardened, we can take it out. And so there are new ideas to, to do bridges. And also 3D printing is not just, we want not just to substitute immediately all the other technologies. Also there is uh, the possibility for hybrid manufacturing. That means to combine the industrial solutions, for example, of concreting slabs, but not 30 centimeters thick, just maybe eight or 10 centimeters thick or even less, and then print on top the ribs. So Pierluigi Nervi, he used this ferrocement uh, formworks, which was a lot of work, but this nice expression of the slabs, we can easily get back by printing fresh on fresh uh, the concrete uh, on a concreted plate. And also in steel construction, what we are doing today when we calculate uh, a steel structure, then we have the, the locations where we have the maximum bending moments and the maximum uh, shear forces. And then for this area, we calculate the whole profile. And then the whole length is this dimension of the profile. So in most areas, this kind of height and related also to, 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 to um, the mass of this uh, steel structure is not needed. So we want to look for a new hybrid manufacturing. So we reduce the height in general. So we do some way a, a middle value for the geometry and then we strengthen in those areas which are highly uh, stressed by print on top on those profiles, just some ribs or we add uh, material at the flanges. So this is also saving a lot of material and is possible to combine both. So at the end, just a small remark, digital tools are the drivers to renew the logic of form, but the basis is our architectural engineering creativity. And uh, as well, we have to respect the rhythm of the nature and our responsibility to keep nature in balance. Thank you very much.
Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Harold, for that uh, fantastic presentation. Um, so uh, for the next presenter, I'm going to introduce uh, Sina Mustafavi. Um, Dr. Sina, it, it's a dual presentation also, right? Shall I introduce? Uh, I'm going to present it myself. So. Okay, sorry. Uh, Dr. Zina Mustafavi is a practicing architect, researcher, and educator with computational design and architectural robotics expertise. Um, he's currently an associate professor at Texas Tech University Huckabee College of Architecture, and he's the director of the High Dars Lab, Hybrid Intelligence Design and Architectural Robotics Systems. Uh, prior to his role at uh, Texas, he held the research and faculty positions at TU Delft in the Netherlands, the Dassau Bauhaus in Germany, and in the UK. His research centers on innovative applications of emerging materials and technologies powered by a fusion of human and machine intelligence for integrated design, inclusive automation, and circular production. He holds a doctoral degree from TU Delft, where he was the manager of the robotic building lab at the, at the Hyperbody Research Group at Bay City. As a practicing architect, he is the founder of Setup Architecture, an award-winning studio aiming to adapt digital design to production technologies to geocultural specificities. His projects have gained re global recognition, exhibited in venues like the Venice Architectural Biennale, the Centre Pompidou in Paris, and the Dodge Design Week. Dr. Mustafabi has received several awards, including Architizer Award, Continental, uh, Continental Euro Asia Award, and the Emerging Scholar Digital Futures Award in 2021. He has been serving on the as a member of the Board of Directors of Acadia and the Editorial Board Member of IAC. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think, yeah, that's, that's my presentation. Yeah. Thank you, Alicia, for the introduction. Um, and yes. Yeah, thank you, Alicia, and the ECC team for arranging this wonderful uh, event. Uh, uh, we are delighted and honored to be part of this uh, uh, forum. Um, I'm Sina Mustafavi, Associate Professor at Texas Tech University, uh, presenting also on behalf of my colleague and collaborator, Dr. Asma Mehan, uh, who unfortunately is not able to join us today. Uh, she's currently in US and it's 4 a.m. there. So uh, Today's talk is divided into two parts. Uh, the first, hybrid intelligence and extended modalities of materialization which aligns with the theme of uh, digital building technologies. And the second part is uh, about our project uh, called Fabricity XR, uh, which is currently at Palazzo Mora. Uh, at Texas Tech, uh, uh, I'm leading HIDAR's uh, lab, Hybrid Intelligence Design and Architectural Robotic Systems. And Dr. Mehan uh, is leading um, Architectural Humanities and Urbanism, AHU lab. The showcased uh, work at ECC Architecture Venice Biennale unites both disciplines under an interdisciplinary project umbrella. So starting with the first uh, part, um, uh, starting with the context, um, um, the, as, as said before, the lecture is divided into two parts, uh, containing three sections in totals, and the, the context provides uh, a background to my works on architectural robotics and design computation. So, One. Yeah, in the context of digital building technologies, much of what we do is about human-machine interaction and collaboration, and how um, um, I believe the essence of what we do is, as architects, builders, and innovators has radically changed uh, and evolved, where boundaries between digital, digital, and uh, physical realms are converged. So, moreover, the focus lies on how we translate intricate physical production systems into programmable uh, processes. As you can see in this uh, case, in Loom's, in this case, in Loom's machine, they're using similar punch cards that they were using um, um, in uh, early computers like IBM computers. So, uh, and at the same time, um, uh, much of what we do is about how we can redefine the fundamental ways of materializing architecture. What are the fundamental differences when we subtract the material out of a mass, like the cases that we were seeing before, and what are the differences when we assemble uh, materials together in an additive uh, manner. And how do we associate uh, performance criteria with topological and geometric variations, and how do we benefit from this complexity? Like the case 
that you see on the left, where the uh, different sizes of the cavities in this music chamber result into better performance. So the complexity resulting to a better performance. So ornament is not only um, a, 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 an aesthetic feature, but also a, a performative aspect. And how digital technologies can uh, allow us to, to provide a higher level of resolution. And beyond um, looking into the finished product, how we can look into the sequences of constructions. Because when, if you, when we work with automation, the sequence of construction and sequence of assembly is uh, extremely important. And I think, uh, like the cases that we were seeing in the previous presentations, looking into the sequence of construction and manufacturing in other industries is also informative. And in a larger scale, how uh, through simulation and computation we can save lives and matters, uh, uh, use less materials, and also through uh, simulation we can uh, uh, predict uh, uh, performance uh, or uh, function of the design. And when it comes to constructability, I would like to argue that like usually um, uh, what we see visually as simple is not necessarily, necessarily constructible. At least in this case, as you can see here, the architects were, were initially, initially proposing two, uh, three simple curves, one straight curves and one circular curves. But the, the construction engineers came up with this idea of representing the whole shape with a more visually complex uh, continuous curve. But since this is mathematically explainable and describable, um, uh, we can address any point in space. So what we usually uh, consider visually complex is not necessarily uh, complex when it comes to fabrication. And how we can benefit from a complexity in multiple scales, right? So how we can um, uh, um, benefit from complexity in micro scale and macro scale, and then how these uh, um, uh, different scales change the, change the way we design. So again, uh, to give another, another background, um, uh, much of what we do is about how emerging technologies are transforming the experience and practice of architecture, and um, uh, how we can bridge the gap between design and construction using different disciplines, such as automation, computation, and uh, innovation in materialization. Moving to the second part of uh, the presentation, I would like to uh, share uh, some of my previous projects on architectural robotics, which is summarized in this recent book of mine called Hybrid Intelligence in Architectural Robotic Materialization, which introduced um, um, porosity, hybridity, and assembly as three pillars of working with robots when we materialize our, our building components. So porosity is very much about like how we can control the ratio between mass and void. So, and when it comes to porosity, um, um, uh, I believe the computation of porosity usually uh, use uh, techniques such, such as finite element methods, which result into what we call the discrete geometry. And these discrete geometries, like the way we were seeing in some previous presentations, are not necessarily fabricatable. So how, how do we translate this uh, discrete geometry into continuous paths for robotic fabrication, I think is one of the main challenges when, we, when it comes to uh, additive, ma additive manufacturing. And then at the same time, how can we customize our setup, production setup, according to different material properties, different material resolutions? These are uh, some of the early works that I've been doing to Delft, uh, which was about like printing on previously sub subtracted uh, formwork to, to minimize the um, uh, effort for creating complex uh, double, uh, single curvature, in this case, uh, geometries. And how we can work with these systems and uh, develop our systems as we um, uh, progress with the design, and then use different disciplines such as structural analysis, structural optimization, and then how, again, we translate the results of um, finite element method to continuous tool paths for robotic 3D printing. So in this case, we were developing a, a method to uh, follow the same, let's say, point cloud, which is extracted from the topology optimization, and then in a continuous manner, uh, um, uh, print uh, this porous structure layer by layer. I think I missed one slide. Never mind. So these are uh, these are some of uh, uh, our recent work at Texas Tech University, which we are also extending our robotic fabrication lab, looking into again um, continuous tool pass strategies for uh, concrete robotic 3D printing, among other works. The second pillars of um, uh, robotic materialization. 
um, uh, to me is hybridity, which was also addressed in some of the previous presentations, which is about, on the one hand, working with multiple materials, so how we can enable our, uh, our processes and ourselves to compute multimateriality, uh, but at the same time, how we can benefit from combining different methods of fabrication. So whether it's combination of additive and subtractive, or even, in this case, combination of two subtractive processes, and informing our geometry or the way we chop down our geometry into smaller components according to fabrication logic. For instance, in this case, you see like how the combination of um, um, uh, developable surfaces, which are producible with hot wire cutting, is combined with like double curvature surfaces, which are pr uh, producible with milling, and then how this is informing our, our design in an iterative manner. And then looking into the hybridity when it comes to like combining multiple materials, how we can benefit from robotic fabrication, to uh, combine different materials and potentially also change the behavior of uh, certain materials. So for instance, in this case, we are, we are approaching milling um, in an unconventional way. We are peeling off, uh, let's say, um, um, stripes of materials from a, a, a rigid cork boards, which results into a certain controlled flexibility in order to translate this, let's say, solid um, 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 materials into a bendable uh, materials for uh, acoustic purposes. Or looking into the ways we can rethink about um, formworks rather than using a, a two-sided formworks work with, in this case, four-sided formworks to um, allow us to keep some part of the formwork without any use of a glue um, and then, uh, again, benefit from the, the combination of two materials uh, which uh, in this case combines uh, structural capacities of a concrete and insulative capacity of a uh, foam. And looking to the ways we can again combine different techniques of uh, manufacturing. So in this case, looking to the ways we can combine subtractive and additive manufacturing, which somehow is uh, summarized in this uh, project called Hybrid Chair, which again combines different techniques of fabrication and the design is informed According, this, according to these di different techniques of fabrication. So we are using hot wire cutting where we have single curvature surfaces and milling is only applied where we need double curvature surfaces and like concave surfaces. And then uh, additive manufacturing is then applied uh, where the seating is uh, uh, taking place. And then obviously working with different resolutions and like embedding engravings in this case for uh, the uh, addi additive manufacturing to happen. And then uh, as you can see here, again, as uh, said before, like m working with multiple scales, in this case, um, uh, even in the um, uh, printing of the silicon on top of this uh, uh, um, uh, EPS, uh, there is a, uh, let's say, uh, uh, intricate um, pattern of uh, scene curves which sort of disappear as we get into the tip, tip of the cantilever and then this results into a stability on the lower part of the cells. The last part is about assembly, how we can grow larger, larger than the size of the production system or the production setup that we have. And I, and I think this is one of the fundamental aspects of uh, working with architectural robotic systems when it comes to architecture because um, 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 if you look into the automotive industry, so the production system can be larger than the car that we are producing, but when it comes to um, architecture, I think looking into the ways uh, that address assembly um, during the production of uh, our, our uh, structures or after the production of our structures is uh, a key component, and how we can work with potentially one detail and one building, um, so and then altering that details in order to achieve the complexity that we are uh, looking for. Um, to conclude this part, I would like to um, uh, elaborate on uh, three aspects uh, of working with um, um, architectural robotic systems. One is data-driven and integrated design. The second part is applied and experimental spectrums of our research, and then um, uh, multidisciplinary and immersive medium, mediums when it comes to architectural education and also architectural practice. So um, 
as said before, uh, much of what we do is about how we can control complexity and then how we can benefit from the complexity. And when it comes to complexity, uh, um, things like structure analysis or environmental analysis are more measurable. But I do believe that like there are other aspects of um, uh, architectural performance that we can also make measurable and then benefit from uh, another level of complexity. So in a way, um, um, our project, our, our process is very much about like how we can work with multiple materials, multiple scales, and multiple modes of uh, construction and fabrication and address multi-criteria in our performance. Um, and working with families, families of objects, so rather than working what, with one single um, 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 type of component, how we can uh, uh, think about the process almost as a kind of a uh, dissecting or surgery process and, uh, and then address the simulation early in the design. And when it, when it comes to families of objects, according to the production system and then according to the produ production space, we can uh, expand our, let's say, capabilities in, in production um, and uh, producing uh, larger families of objects. Um, and then um, I, I think there is a fundamental difference between what we do in research and practice, but uh, back to what also Alicia was addressing uh, about like how, how digital technologies can make um, um, craftsmen and, and builders proud. I think this is also a good example, um, uh, a recent uh, project of ours which we finished um, uh, with a, uh, collaboration with local craftsmen. Uh, and then in this case, we are combining uh, local stone craft with uh, digital fabrication and addressing uh, two levels of, uh, let's say, tolerances and resolutions. One working with uh, metal, which is uh, um, um, CNC and cut uh, using uh, digital fabrication, and then using natural stone to to combine these these two two let's say levels of tolerance, and then uh, this results into a kind of a dry assembly for uh, constructing stone um, uh, elements. So um, this was also addressed to some extent, like embracing the resolution and tectonics. Uh, um, obviously, like. Increasing the resolution can result into better um, um, design and better uh, uh, outcomes. But uh, it is also very much about like how we embrace this uh, resolution, as you uh, could see also in the previous project um, in stone. And and looking into the cultural references is also important because like one of the drivers, for instance, uh, for the previous project was also uh, giving reference to um, uh, techniques such as Moganas, but I would argue that like, when it comes to um, 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 uh, digital fabrication and also like using of AI uh, and generative AI, we are, we are very much also like dealing with certain level of bias and like uh, embedded bias in our, 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 our um, uh, computational systems and and processes, and then we were looking into this uh, uh, in, in, an, in a recent publication of, of us, which we are looking into the way uh, um, um, generative AI is uh, sort of biased towards certain uh, regions and certain um, uh, backgrounds. So one of the one of the critiques that I got from uh, got about uh, the former project that I showed was. Um, that like uh, the windows that uh, you saw in that building is also similar to the Windows 95, which if you think about it is maybe true because I'm also a Windows 95 generation and how, how we are uh, also like in a kind of a, uh, unconscious way we are biased about what we design is also, I would say, important. And back to the Windows 95 gener generation, this was also one of the Early, early games or early examples of uh, simulation-based games, which I was really uh, fascinated about, uh, which basically use a very simple Galileo um, uh, projectile uh, formula. But there is also um, a certain level of, let's say, um, um, simulation and complexity here, which I think when it comes to the context of um, um, today's architectural education and architectural practices, working with this um, um, simulation-based and systemic uh, uh, thinking way of like design and uh, des developing processes is also very much important. So in a way, 
in multiple levels, data is the new material that we are working with, um, and this range from uh, urban scale to material scales uh, and uh, fabrication scale. And to which extent the, 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 the data can be personalized is something that we were also looking into, especially in um, uh, the installation that we are showing in the uh, Biennale. So we were looking into the way the personalized data can result into uh, um, a modes of uh, generation or creation. So uh, in this case, the students were looking into the way they were reacting to different musics or different movies, and then this resulted into a kind of a direct translation of um, design to materialization. This, this project call, was called Quantify Me, which was about, like again, uh, looking into the personalized level of data. And um, um, also looking into um, what is called uh, soft robotics or human-robot collaboration. Um, um, so I think working with industrial robots is, is fascinating, but also like the way um, um, uh, robots which are designed for human-robot collaborations can also provide another, let's say, adjacency or like an, another proximity to their robotic setups. Uh, we were looking into uh, the ways we can uh, use robotic fabrication using uh, um, these cobots, and then how we can, um, uh, let's say, train our robots for assembly. But when it comes to assembly, I think one of the fundamental um, uh, uh, or important aspect is like, uh, usually humans are more smarter when it comes to assembly. So on the one hand, we can design our projects for, for assembly, but at the same time, I think augmented reality can also provide a lot of opportunities for, for um, growing larger than the production setup that we have. Or otherwise, we have to like really com customize our, our components for a specific uh, cobotic assembly processes, like the way you see here in this reciprocal system. Um, I'm gonna skip uh, this last part because I think I'm running out of time. But um, to conclude, uh, we were also looking into the ways we can collaborate with other industries. Like in this case, we were collaborating with Audi. Uh, the, we were asked to, to design a shell for a, a, a car, a, a city car, and then we were looking into the ways we can collaborate with other disciplines, such as design um, um, uh, department, in this case, together with architects, and also looking into the ways we can also customize our materials, which I think somehow also connect to the next presentation, um, and then how, how we can customize our materials according to different techniques of fabrication. For instance, in this case, we are using bioplastics, but in one of the processes we are using additive manufacturing, so we are customizing that materials for uh, additive manufacturing processes, and then we are, we are customizing the same material for casting or cutting. And there is a, um, uh, uh, let's say, um, um, threshold between the way we can customize these uh, materials. And when it comes to architectural education and architectural practices, this is very much changing the landscape of our architectural practice and our architectural education to the extent that we, uh, rather than designing uh, for, um, uh, let's say, known components, the way this, this uh, I would say, poor robot is trying to uh, assemble this, this um, um, uh, board, um, uh, is, is one way to look into the, to, to the automation. Another way is to customize our design for, for automation and, and production processes. Uh, moving to the last part of uh, our presentation, which uh, share our experience and our project in Palazzo Mora. Um, the project is titled Fabricity XR, uh, which again brings two disciplines of architectural humanities and architectural robotics together. We were looking into the ways we can um, uh, map uh, digital data into, into, a, into this lattice structure. So that's why uh, we are, again, working with dif different disciplines, and uh, we have the chance to also work with different sponsors, so that, such as X3 and um, um, augmented reality, uh, WebBest AR, which is an uh, online augmented reality platforms. And then uh, we are bringing, again, two disciplines of design competition and fabrication and um, uh, urban community design development. And then the bridge between the two is uh, the, the platforms that we develop in a web, uh, um, web AR platform, which I'm going to uh, explain later. Again, this is an overview of the research poster, which is also 
presented in the uh, Palazzo Moro, again, bringing t three disciplines of um, design, composition, and fabrication, uh, urban community um, uh, development, which is mapping, in this case, uh, social and environmental justice in two cities of Amsterdam and Houston, and then uh, mapping the data through digital uh, mapping into the lattice structure. Oops. Um, I think. Yeah. And um, unfortunately, uh, Dr. Mahan is not here to, to share more insight about the urban community de development aspects of the project, but basically it's about mapping social and environmental justice in two cities of Amsterdam and Houston, and then uh, picking four sites, which represent four pillars of this installation as physical models, which are again detectable with uh, uh, web AR platforms as the starting for point for these digital trails, uh, which again um, is based on uh, uh, her uh, upcoming monograph on um, uh, mapping social, social environmental justice in um, uh, metropolitan cities. Um, again, um, I, 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 I do not have that much information related to the urban community de development, but related to the, to the, to the installation, um, the digital trace starts from four physical models, and they are detectable with any uh, smartphones without uh, any use of um, uh, external, let's say, uh, applications. So um, the users engage with the pavilion um, uh, through uh, their phone. But if I want to uh, speak more about the design computation fabrication, for us, uh, an important factor was um, uh, assemblability and disassemblability of the project. And then uh, we were looking into the ways we can um, optimize our lattice structure using um, local materials. And in this case, we are um, uh, using uh, four types of dowels, uh, locally resourced, resource, and then we are developing a computational uh, design workflow to, uh, rather than uh, finalizing the design and the final material for that, we are uh, uh, setting our material palette and then uh, optimize our um, uh, design output uh, with this material uh, palette, which is um, 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 provided um, locally and resourced locally. Um, and then there is also um, a concrete 3D print printing component uh, to, the, to the project. Um, as said, uh, the digital trails are uh, starting from uh, these physical models and then uh, working with continuous toolpaths uh, uh, was also uh, another aspect of the project, which was also uh, explained before. So uh, this is an overview of the installation. Uh, as I said before, we have four starting points. And then uh, here you see also some snapshots of uh, the way the users can read the information digitally uh, on top of the pavilion and um, uh, navigate through this uh, uh, trails. This is a kind of a call out of one of the trails. Again, uh, it starts from the physical models. So the, the image of the physical models is detectable with the uh, AR uh, platforms. And then the users will be uh, 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 guided through uh, uh, different, uh, uh, let's say, dynamic QR codes, which again, another la layers of information is mapped uh, onto the pavilion. Here you see an overview in the Palazzo Mora, uh, room six. Again, four, four starting point for the digital trades and the lattice structure, which is um, assembled uh, there. Some snapshots of the way uh, the people uh, can interact with the uh, pavilion and then read the information. Um, we have captured the data over the past six months, uh, and this would be also another interesting factors that we would like to analyze and uh, to see uh, how people have been reacting and, and interacting with the, with the installation. And then obviously this has been done uh, uh, in a very collaborative setup, uh, including students and external collaborative and industry partners. And again, some other snapshots uh, from um, the uh, venue. I think I have two videos just to give you an idea. Let's 
So this is, uh, I mean, there should be also a sound, but um, people can interact. It's fine. No, the sound of interaction. Yes. Okay, and the next one maybe also shows the um, assembly process of uh, using uh, Hololens. Um, so uh, over the course of two days, uh, we are assembling the structure uh, using a augmented reality uh, headset. So there is one guy here wearing the Hololens and instructing the others, um, and. Uh, we need to undo this in the coming two days. So there's gonna be a, a lot of disassembly fun. Um, so since the connections are dry and so the, the whole structure is uh, stable in, in compression and then th when we insert the tension pins in the, in the, in the joints, uh, so the structure uh, achieves its uh, uh, um, rigidity. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sina. Um, for our um, next speaker, I would like to introduce uh, Hannah Dahi. Hannah is a registered architect, engineer, and product developer. Uh, she established the Biomat Copenhagen Research Center at the Aalborg University in 2022, at the Tech Technical Faculty of IT and Design at the Institute of Sustainability and Planning. And she's also the CEO of Biomat TGU at TTI. Since 2022, after the great success of her established Biomat department at ITKE, Faculty of Architecture and Urban Planning in Stuttgart, Germany since 2016 and after grounding her architectural office in Cairo since 2003. Dai holds diverse patents in the field of sustainable building solutions, especially biomaterials and recycling applications in the building industry. Her patents are internationally registered in the EU region, Germany, the US and Malaysia. She developed the new architectural design philosophy, materials as a design tool, based on applying alternative resources as a starting point in the design process. This philosophy intends to reach sustainable future architecture to targeting available local and bioannually renew renewable resources, integrating digital tools like dig digital fabrication technologies and parametric computational tools. She designed and fabricated a number of innovative, sustainable and smart building products er earning numerous design awards and won diverse industrial project funds. She has designed and constructed numerous architectural landscape projects, as well as a di diverse range of experimental architectural pavilions in different regions, including Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa. So uh, thank you very much, Hannah. I don't know if this works. Yeah. Thanks a lot for the nice introduction and uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, maybe before I start, I would like to uh, mention a very, very precious person to thank, my mom, who I have unfortunately uh, lost at the beginning of this month, which um, was a coincidence because this month is considered the most intensive month to give uh, open lectures in. This is, I think, the seventh or eighth accidentally. So instead of canceling them all, I decided to carry on and uh, give the speech further because uh, she's um, a professor of architectural technologies. Her name is uh, Nadia Thabit. And I carried uh, or inherited the guilt <laughs> of our built environment and the, um, the issue of resources, which is uh, having a very big link to the topic today. And um, it's uh, worth mentioning maybe that she worked a lot in the area of uh, concrete and she developed in the, even in the 80s a, uh, a um, prefabrication system that I later saw in Germany in 2011. So she was indeed a pioneer and I'm so much thankful to be the daughter and continuing this path. 
So if I'm allowed, I would really love to talk about resources further, just as uh, the, uh, the very dear colleagues and friends uh, talked in um, the center of exercising what, how could we pick up a resource that is obviously underestimated and how to carry this further to another level and see using the technologies that we have, how this could be turned into another level in our built environment. And this was actually the base of creating the concept of materials as a design tool, which is having the factors of materials design and fabrication as major components within the design process and getting into a bottom-up approach, seeing what type of developments could we do from one single resource, which is one topic here that is going to be um, intensively mentioned, the biomaterials and especially annually renewable natural fibers coming either from the restovers of the agricultural residuals or from what we call industrial natural fibers like flax, hemp, jute, and others. And this was the background of the creation of the biomed um, organizations, uh, first at Stuttgart at the university and then followed up by Copenhagen and then the company. So as said, the exercise basically here is the biomaterials and specifically natural fibers because of this dramatic photo that um, I always like to share because this was mainly a, one of the movements that um, got me in person like in charge of trying as good as possible but from an architectural point of view to see how to get the benefit of this type of resource. We have here a burnout of annually renewable restovers of the agricultural stream. Basically in every region, cereals are being grown and then the rest over are unfortunately burnt out in open fields by farmers because they simply want to use the land. So this is considered to be a problem in the agricultural sector, but a resource for us because we have a problem in the resources area in our case. This drive me to move in that area and talk to many colleagues who have the expertise of manufacturing and manufacturing technologies there in Germany, and to see how could be a possibility to turn those single fibers into one unified element and to exactly tackle how to make the, um, the geometry, how to make it in a one single component. And through my PhD studies, I developed like at least 20 different um, solutions. And one of them, what was called later bioflexi, is um, in the composition of actually a fiber board a, with a very large number of recycled natural fibers, up to 90% by weight, and they are compounded by a thermoplastic elastomer that could be recycled and that could be even biodegraded under um, industrial compost conditions. And when we reinforce them up and down like a sandwich panel in specific directions, they could get literally almost any kind of geometry, which is, of course, for us as designers, as architects, a very big dream. And this um, caused then the possibility to see what could go further, like the upscaling process first in the most simple way in investigating in the furniture industry, in giving this further to uh, um, students and uh, um, working together, understanding how we could change the polymer, we add pigments, we change casting, we change the production method, and then we create various solutions that started first interiorly as um, applications in inside, indoors, full flooring systems, different kinds of setups, partitions, cladding systems of several kinds, but then moving out later bigger as you will see. But also there was a nice chance in our studio to investigate on living materials like mycelium, for instance. This is a very nice example of how mycelium has been engineered to move to close the rattan skeleton that was applied here as a structural system, which obviously had its, uh, its very nice uh, outcome at the end, holding the weight up to 100 kilograms, while its own doesn't weigh even one kilogram. But then, we carried this guilt further and we wanted to move along and upscale our solutions. So you see here six different um, projects that um, definitely without the expertise of everyone involved, this would not have come 
to a solution and the one in the middle, this is the SCB, the Sustainable Circular Bridge project that was, um, or that is gonna end very, very soon. This is, uh, oh, this was directed by the Technical University of Eindhoven. So I would like to um, just move um, by manufacturing process like journey for journey to see how things could change by changing the system of fabrication. So you see here the first bioflexi done, which was a sandwich, uh, which was a, a fiberboard uh, composite, as you see, but then turned into a sandwich element and applied first in the uh, project of the Biomet uh, Pavilion of 2018, where a span of 10 meters has been covered and a height of 3 meters. Within the project itself, we had to develop also a further um, biocomposites that you will see later. But it is the idea of human-centered design at the end. This was opened up as a kind of competition to our students because this was given in the form of our design studio and they had the chance to also grab the material in hand and see how they could actively engage in the fabrication process of turning the real material that was produced at that time into a building component. And uh, in that case, you see here through vacuuming and in our studios, we started as good as possible to um, find enough tricks to have the possibility to uh, apply the veneer, which has a specific direction of reinforcement, two directions of reinforcements, in fact, on its top in the fiber length direction, and its back, it has a reinforcement perpendicular on it. This allowed a freeform possibility to take place, and Definitely, since this is a segmented shell construction, the um, connections played a huge role. So we had to investigate on different setups of uh, joints and all were tested to pick up the highest uh, one with the highest um, performance. And we basically, like we were the jokers, playing almost all the roles uh, from the production of the uh, elements on a small scale up to getting them in position. But definitely the, uh, the integral collaboration with the structural engineers from the Technical University of Eindhoven and the colleagues of Geodesy enabled us reaching the, the needed level of quality assurance because since this is a non-conventional building element that needs a non-conventional construction method, then it was needed to have the point cloud through 3D laser scanning of the terrain and of the location before, during, and after the, uh, the construction to measure out every single component where it should end to reach the level of accuracy that we need to reach. So this shows generally the bottom-up approach that really took place from the material research up till the fabrication and the design collaboration with the structural engineers. This is the malleability of the fiber board and those are where the designs created during the design studio to pick up one that is actually none of the above. It is like the single component was composed by one of the students but we had to generate our own designs back again to be buildable. It is worth mentioning that every single detail was uh, monitored and uh, we had uh, only four forms to produce the 370 pieces of um, um, elements. And then we had to make um, like a small uh, fabric in our studio where the components were all um, reinforced through the veneer and then treated for the weathering resistance and then everything was got in position. So the site itself, it was on two levels. Uh, there was a difference of 1.5 meter difference and we had to position our three footages superficially and fill it with gravel and heavy substance because we were not allowed to make any anchors to the ground. There was an auditorium underneath and you see the level of accuracy uh, would have not been reached without the uh, geodesy colleagues and without the other experts. If we move along, it was um, also a journey to uh, try to investigate on other um, uh, fabrication systems, and this is what we call, or what is called, Taylor fiber placement technique. This is a system that is um, taken from the uh, the um, uh, 
textile industry and we came to know about it for the first time from the dear colleagues of the aircraft design where they applied different types of materials uh, like uh, carbon fibers and glass fibers and then we suggested to apply ours and in this case flex fibers and hemp fibers. And what basically took place is that we suggested that we're gonna have a shell construction, a freestanding, let's say, um, a freestanding component for a bus station, for instance, and then we would assume that there, were, is, there is someone who's gonna try to hold it on top and to just try as good as possible to suggest the flow of stresses. And then through topology optimization, we got the unnecessary materials out. And in order to stitch it, we had to flatten the surface first and to uh, make it into different layers and cut it down into the size that is equivalent to the size of the head of the machine. So basically, we had those preforms and we had to have a uh, form work which we built up from uh, balsa uh, wood that we were able to reuse again. So we bent the surface of the mold and we applied it on a waffle structure. This is the outline just for imagination of how this took place. So we basically used two types of uh, physical forms of uh, the flex fibers uh, in the form of tapes, the ones that you see here, and in the form of yarns. And equally, also a kind of competition was opened and there was a very good collaboration with the Technical University of the Czech Republic where the structural engineers from there, plus the, um, the other colleagues from aircraft design. Here you see as the process of uh, selection of the design took place and here is the stitching as the tailoring process took place. Those are the bobbins that we had to prepare and take in advance and then fix on the head of the machines. It's an additive manufacturing technology like most of the technologies that were shown and will be shown further in the presentation just as talk today. We deposit the material where it is really needed. So here the process it depends a lot on the type even of stitching, if it's uh, a zigzag or if it is parallel. And then this is a dry process that a, we take the stitched pieces on the stretch membrane and then we fix them on the mold and then place at the very last stage another type of uh, tape fibers were applied. Here is the, the pro process of submassage for our fibers where it is uh, having the resin uh, in it. And as you see, it is very, very much similar to the boat industry and aircraft industry where the mold um, is being applied and then it's closed after the resin infusion takes place and then yeah voila it's very thin uh, component and it's just a couple of centimeters maybe one or one and a half centimeter thick or maybe two but it's another setup of filigran uh, lightweight structures that um, also have another visual aesthetics and uh, we, we really indeed learned a lot through it. It was only 35 kilograms. On a further basis, we kept trying different setups of trying minimal surfaces like this gyroid and this uh, composition of modular systems and how to cover up the uh, connections between these systems that are composed of the flex or hemp fibers and the different setups of resins and uh, how to cover up having different uh, geometrical constellations whenever we rotate the, the unit and this was leading to another development that happened um, on the industrial scale with one of the companies in Germany who actually produce uh, the Airbus. In the corona time, they wanted to open up another field of uh, um, like a business line for architecture and um, they came to us and we created this uh, nice development together and this had an innovation prize in Paris last year. A further setup has to do with poltrusion as a technique. Uh, in, in this system, a, another development of a uh, shell construction, a um, double curved one was applied and in a, um, in a sense that uh, might be a bit similar to bamboo in the sense of creating these setups of um, uh, uh, structures. Of course, bamboo is a total different system that, that is 
timber on its own that is a wood system and it needs a lot of energy to be able to bend. In our case, we have the we had the possibility to apply the bending um, as it uh, it is uh, taking place. So it was the first production or the first um, confirmation of the hypothesis that we could indeed bend this poltruded. What is called the poltruded is a uh, fibers um, or profiles. They are. Uh, profiles that are um, the fibers are in specific linear directions and it was possible to bend on both sides and the stored energy was applied structurally. Here is the the process that the hero one of the heroes behind it is or sitting in the in the room uh, the dear Jenny so she is the uh, PhD candidate responsible of this project. And uh, you see here the process of the poltrusion taking place where the fibers are aligned inside specific holes of this, uh, this um, uh, tool. And here you see the process of investigating on how the curvature uh, would be reaching and accordingly the 3D model was created. It was several studies and there were colleagues also for the structural engineers from the, our institute, from the ITKE at that time. And um, it was possible to, to see how uh, could we, in this case, create the girder on the three girders um, on the three sides of the pavilion that covers the span of 10 meters and the height up to 4.5 meters. Here you see the process of investigation, uh, how, what would be the bending radius and the lashing technique that was originally definitely known from the Asian uh, architecture here we replaced it with specific uh, setup of steel threads and then you see the detailing that was on the three girders each girder was composed of two uh, profiles and in this case the footage was a very large footage on one level as you see here in the middle uh, from timber and everything as well was superficial here is within the process just directly um, before removing the single um, columns uh, till it gets into the status of equilibrium. And then afterwards, it was uh, the, uh, the membrane was uh, applied. So again, and this is another example that is lying in the area of the uh, Frei Otto, godfather <laughs> of us, and uh, this was uh, another tr tradition of uh, gathering different setups of technologies and also uh, the, the, um, the specific um, uh, type of, of structure and its lightness was um, the reflection behind it. Again, another additive manufacturing, which is very much linked to what we have here in-house in Palazzo Mora, the um, 3D printing um, of uh, specific types of newly developed filaments that are composed of um, uh, the, the rest over from uh, the wood industry and uh, filaments also from uh, bioplastics. There was a very big team behind that, and uh, as usual, uh, we, we always um, start small and then we move large. So we developed a lot of uh, solutions also regarding connections, and it is worth mentioning that also the very nice collaboration with a very dear um, Lucio and the ELEC colleagues was behind this very nice um, a column that uh, was uh, again a segmented one and uh, it is present here in the first floor in Palazzo Mora. You can, you are actually very much welcome to have a look later. Um, the the um, exhibition itself was proposing or was showcasing three different projects at least and um, it you can see it live so I would not um, take extra time to talk about it in details but Please uh, find the way and uh, have a look. Just like a couple of meters. Um, also, it's it's worth mentioning that we, as good as possible, try to use different types of resin systems. Here, there is uh, chitin and chitosan behind, and those are produced from the uh, shell of uh, shells of insects and marine creatures, like shrimps, for instance. We were invited by the colleagues of the chemistry faculty. 
and uh, we had an input to that and tried as good as possible to investigate within a fluid deposition um, procedure to reinforce also with cellulose fibers and to have them uh, printed and as well in the area of additive, uh, adaptive and smartness, we had as well an input there where the um, possibility of integration of elastic zones were there to create a kind of kinematic and adaptive system as well as this rotatory uh, facade that you see, all of those in which the um, tailoring fiber placement has been as well investigated. Um, in addition, the robotic assembly was also one of the topics that we try to integrate in our work and uh, to implement it, it has to have uh, an input uh, definitely from the initial design phase. One of the uh, nice projects that we are currently working on has to do with vertical farmings uh, with the colleague of Aachen. Uh, we were invited to include a vertical farming system that is called um, Orbiloop to uh, investigate how to integrate this specific type of um, um, integral vertical farming system. So you just to imagine this, this is a garden that is very compact and the garden is actually plants that are uh, compacted in a revolving uh, t um, tape or band and it is so compact to the possibility that this could be integrated in facade systems. So we developed with the colleagues of the Fraunhofer EVE um, the, the understanding of how the system works enabled us as architects to have a kind of catalog settlement of how to implement and to integrate this system with already existing um, uh, existing buildings and as well to new buildings. So the outcome was uh, basically having to do with identifying the location and uh, seeing the requirements and architectural conception as well as the performance simulation in order to come out with the end with the criteria of selection of how this system could be integrated in, um, in, in buildings on different setups. This is the location currently in Aachen. This is how the, uh, the, the um, uh, plantation is taking place. Uh, we are uh, planting uh, salads and uh, different types of fruits, uh, specifically strawberries at the moment. And this is just to um, have an imagination of how this is being integrated in buildings. Also, um, the final and uh, biggest uh, project has to do with uh, bridges. Um, the one um, that you see here, um, this uh, the, the deck of the bridge that is not concrete because people sometimes get mistaken because it has this color that seems to be concrete, which is not the case. It is, uh, according to the requirements, had been given that color, but originally it had the same color of natural fibers. So the, this is this is the, um, um, the reflection of the project called Sustainable Circular Bridges, uh, that is an interreg EU project that is directed from the Technical University of Eindhoven, and we are basically five uh, companies, uh, five uh, universities, seven companies, and three cities in that project. Um, the first uh, uh, um, bridge was already built last year at the Day of Earth in um, uh, Almere in Netherlands. It had a span of 15 meters and the width of 3 meters. And the co-design definitely took place with the colleagues of Fiber who uh, fabricated the uh, balustrade and definitely with the structural engineers of the Technical University of Eindhoven. Here you see as the process of making is taking place and um, you see here on the bottom left uh, how the core itself was made of foam and all around the core or the body of the bridge uh, uh, flex fibers have been applied. This is in the fiber core um, in Rotterdam. This is the company who was responsible of making the bridge body. The coming one is supposed to come, um, yeah, actually this is the photo of the partners on the bridge and this is a permanent one for cyclists and pedestrians. And the, uh, the coming one is in Ulm, in, near the uh, Ulm, very well-known uh, Ulm Cathedral. Um, and the designs have been um, long ago already 
finished um, um, it has a philosophical input about the location itself the very uh, specific location and how the the old meets the new uh, meaning the technology and also the location where this exists and also it's important to mention that it makes a big difference as an architect to know in advance how this is going to be put together and also the fabrication system behind it so this is the the outcome so far for the uh, the design, we hope to have an opening time soon. So to sum up, um, there is there are so many um, developments that were done uh, with our teams and with our partners. I hope it comes. <laughs> yes. So the idea is that we're trying as good as possible to cover the gaps, to close the gaps of what we can do already today with the technologies we have. We're trying as good as possible to find out the components, even at the conventional architectural um, setup that we see here. I mean, it was intentionally that I tried to make the graphs on the kind of architecture we already know today and to try to see how many elements we could possibly replace. So uh, the state of art today, yes, we can, we can claim that we have the possibility to cover already many components that we are having from different materials, from different fabrication techniques in our, uh, in our uh, work already today. And um, um, of course, those numbers have been mentioned a couple of times, but we can have a different variation um, that... Um, you can see, I mean, if we're talking about um, uh, renewable resources of every kind, or also harvesting energy on the city level, how this um, would mean for a complete city and how this could change our um, future architecture. By this, I come to the end of the presentation and I'd like to thank you a lot and also I'd like to thank the Biomed people here, also Vanessa, um, for their great inputs. Those are the heroes of Biomed. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Hannah. That was very, very fantastic uh, presentations. Um, and, and I think it has been a very, very exciting set of different uh, takes and projects and different ways. That I, um, I think it really showed that uh, the forces that are kind of shaping architecture and our industry are very external to the discipline, right? So there is materials and um, material engineering, the, X, the AR, VR that Adzina was showing, and uh, uh, concrete sand, different ways of making the robotic fabrication, uh, 3D printing, so all of these kind of different uh, technological advances that are, uh, but are also like ecological, like on the terms of a lot of the materials and the growth that, that Anna was showing. And um, kind of a lot of these pressures are kind of are really changing, I think, how we, what is our agency as architects and how do we have agency and how do we adapt to this um, in ways that maybe we're not expected, but I think that also allow us to expand the reach of our practice and to redefine how our profession engages with the world. And I think that there are very, very interesting samples I've been here, here today. So I would like to see, um, I would like to uh, ask all of you on, on the panel, like, um, how do you think that architects can design when, when the architectural profession as always, uh, we, we have like short-term goals that we need to achieve in a very kind of immediate future while kind of addressing a lot of the hyper objects, a lot of the things that you were mentioning, like climate change, like, uh, like the pollution, like all of these that kind of really operate in a longer term scale than the, than the scale that we normally operate. So, so how do you see within all of these new innovations that, that you are working on that we can bridge or we can, we can, oper we can, uh, allow these, the practice to adapt to, to this uh, vision or to, to, to enable this vision. I think when Adaria was talking about to make in uh, three years what happens in a hundred years, right? So, 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 so what, what is your, um, how do you see this in, in each of your different contexts? Okay, I may, I may start. I think the challenge we have to face is the fact that it is not a kind of um, slow evolution process uh, because we just don't have the time and so I was mentioning the the concept of disruptive and I think this is what we need in architecture and I believe e every of us in different ways we engage technologies in different ways um, but we see the chance to have 
a quick transformation of the way we are practicing. And it's about designing in terms of at material level. I mean, Anna was, was telling about that. It's about um, engaging uh, manufacturing technologies, about engaging uh, structural design. And I believe the target, uh, I mean, it, it is for me, but I believe it's, it's for all of us, is to say it's not about getting 5% better. It's about getting 40, 50, 60% better. I think if we keep this in mind, uh, then we really manage to have this transformation on one side, but of course to engage the opportunities. I mean, all crises have opportunities which are embedded. And uh, that means we can, uh, by engaging our creative capacity, I mean, Harald, you were uh, talking about creativity at the end, and uh, I really believe this is part of it. So we have to be much more creative to change the way we are shaping our built environment. And we see at the moment really an open field uh, to do that uh, just because it, it is urgently required. So in the projects that we did so far, the best that work, uh, worked actually is the team. So the multidisciplinary that goes way beyond the boundaries of classical uh, architectural education. So that's what I have based on my experience. And what we see now as a climate crisis, it's a lot about material culture. So a lot about reality, also a lot about the material performance and a lot about the um, ecological footprint of the structures that we build. For that, usually architects this is where the kind of border of the discipline comes. But then, of course, the interaction with the material scientists, structural engineers, and mechanical engineers come into play. And uh, what, I, what we were showing here, for example, for the coral tree, that um, we look into the material side, but for this we need a consultancy of the material scientists and the chemists. Or we look into the production that is very tightly uh, a collaboration with the mechanical engineers who are educated for building a real machines that are functioning, but and or in the structural engineers who understand how the system works. And we as architects, we are very good actually at seeing the global level. So seeing the longer perspective and also seeing the overview and assembling the teams and and going together with everyone to the common goal. So this is what I see as a crucial for making a really substantial change in the construction industry in terms of ecological performance of our structures. I think we saw a lot of uh, amazing presentations and uh, ideas how to go into the future. And now the, the difficult thing is how to, to bring all this together. And uh, so when we, when we ref reflect, so then we, we, s we can imagine that the industrialization um, brought us not just uh, the different dis disciplines of architects and engineers, but also of the separation of the whole processes. So today we have so many different participants in, this in design and planning. So a lot of uh, specialists for uh, this and that, and the same in the manufacturing side. So. Uh, for me, is the most important thing besides creativity that we get to unified again um, design and manufacturing as as one process, and um, also the the disciplines of our profession uh, we have to to bring together again. So, let's say the architect um, of the future in my person is a team. So we. <laughs> architects, engineers, they form a team, a design team, and also the, the responsibility, what also you, you were presenting, uh, Alicia, uh, for manufacturing, you know. So we have to, to claim back uh, the guidance of the manufacturing and uh, not just do nice uh, ideas by, by drawings and renderings and give them to the factory and then we are wondering what, what we get on site. So, this is, uh, this is for me uh, very substantial and this is nice to see that by going deep into the knowledge of technology, how things are done, how material is uh, informed, how material gets brought into shape, if we understand this, we are able to guide manufacturing. Yeah, um, yeah I think uh, 
um, it is also depend on how we uh, broadcast and like inform the, the society. Like yes, yesterday we had this panel about immigration and then how um, politicians are uh, ill-informed about how, for instance, immigration is uh, good for the society. So like while immigration can bring a um, positive impact to the society's uh, right wings is like saying, no, we don't need immigrants. So like the po and then if you scale this in, into the context of uh, building industry, so developers tends to like work with con conventional ways of manufacturing and construction. So like therefore uh, prototyping in different scales and informing the industry that things are possible is I, I think would also result into a, a larger impact. For instance, in the context of um, Texas, where uh, I have moved recently, so we have this company called Icon, and like they're printing large scale neighborhoods. And like since there is excitement that like things can happen in larger scale, there are also like more motivations and more let's say interest to invest on this because that people see that this is possible. Of course, like when it gets to that that scale, there might be some um, reductions or like um, um, a loss of quality. But um, since um, they're gonna see this prototype in a larger scale, the society can can embrace it in in multiple levels. Uh, I think that um, maybe as a start, it has to be somehow we need to come up with a radical change in the pedagogy of architecture and to try as good as possible to come on earth and avoid having or treating or telling the, the architecture, the students, that they everyone need to feel as if they are the Picasso of the built environment and that I have a single idea and I have I must, I'm the architect, I must apply it. I think we need to, to respect other disciplines and other types of uh, industries that have gone into so much of development than us and so we need to learn from one another and we need to see how to make things more efficient and to avoid the idea of this solo uh, uh, decision and to, to work with one another with other disciplines. I think through all the presentations it was clear enough that we um, surrender and we have to uh, know what is going on in other technologies and disciplines and we use them properly in our discipline because we need it. That's one. And on the other hand, we have to take um, care of the, um, the, the, the legislation of the site. Because whatever we are doing here in this very nice room, uh, if it doesn't reach to the politicians and if it doesn't go through the proper legislation in a quick modus, we can just talk forever. So we really need to cover the paths, the, the young people to no different stuff, and the end of the story, to have the the impulse in the market in its proper way it should be. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much to all. I don't know if there's anything else anyone wants to add. What um, I think, like uh, along um, all of the presentations, of course, and, and my own practice and work, we know that we are engaging with a lot of. Um, like I, I like the idea of this architect, like more like on the past, a more holistic concept, right? Which is not a single person, but it's like a group, a group of people, right? That that have all the different expertises, and definitely that's something that I think will definitely change the the, the, the way we we approach buildings. How do you see like? Um, that we can engage with all of the different tools. Like, I mean, like there is a lot, uh, every one of us are like using like simulation tools, digital tools, robotics, all of this. How can we engage with those tools in a, as a, as a kind of, um, a, to approach a change on the, on the environment, on actually the built environment? And I think that that, what, what that last step of like, yeah, we know how to do it, we can do the simulations, we can, and I think there was a presentation of like, uh, AI can do whatever, but then how do we manufacture it, right? And, but also, how we can simulate a lot of things, and how do we engage that with the, through, through the material understanding to really make a change on the built environment? How do you think we can make that last step and, and um, uh, the, between the, the tools, all of the tools that we have, and really uh, make, make a change um, that, that can be significant as a, uh, in, the, in, in the way we conceive these designs. Is there something that um, you think the, the, we can, um, the tools can work on that way? Yeah, I, I, when you were uh, 
place in this, uh, I was actually thinking about uh, about the links in a brain, yeah, just as a as a metaphor. And if you think about the way we do work or that we've been working in the past, it is first it is sequential, secondly it is fragmented, as Arad was mentioning, and um, actually all of us engage in digital technology, in design, in manufacturing, and I would add later on in this assembly, because this is the missing part we are all keeping in mind and it should be part of the praxis as well, uh, it cannot be sequential anymore. I mean, uh, the more we think about our architectural practice, the more we have to think, first of all, in circles, and second of all, in a much denser network. That means that uh, the exchange of information between all the different partners, from design to fabrication, has to be iterative, has to be much more cross-linked, and only by doing that we can get to a totally different level of quality, which is uh, helping us hitting the targets. So uh, let's keep our brain with the speed of exchange of information as a kind of um, vision how the practice should, should transform. And uh, we can build a kind of uh, experimental platform in the way we do work, but with the same speed the brain is exchanging information, we should make sure that all what we do in an experimental way is really quickly coming to the practice and showing that things can get quicker, can get more precise, can have higher quality level, can have a different and much more modern aesthetic and can be much more sustainable. I think that should be the target. It doesn't have to be sequential like Daria, go ahead. Oh. But like, yeah. <laughs> we, we again continue. Um, I like very much the idea that actually we don't only use the tools, but we create the tools. I really adore it as architect. And I think that we should approach it from the, that backwards, from the goal. So first we formulate what do we really need. And this is what we always had in our projects. So when you first formulate the goal, then you see how far it goes beyond your discipline and how many people do you need to get on board to have a team and um, where the possible tool that you need to create to solve the problem can lie and then which specialist you need for that to team up to create it. So let's say when we created our machine, we did it from scratch at the Campus Feingen uh, at the University of Stuttgart and we knew what we want to have. So we didn't want to have any commercial tool that we would need to kind of try to adapt for our needs, but we knew that we could be able to build it for our own and have it completely transparent, have it linked with the digital design and the fabrication, and have complete control on the processes that are going. And I like very much how in the process of development, the further possibilities that this tool can do are unfolding in front of your eyes because you're fully engaged in the creation process. So I see this as a very powerful also, you know, like d design by making or design by doing your kind of processing and you're you even updating your tool in the process of its development that gives you also further insights in, in, in the design and construction. Yeah, I think uh, when we're talking, if we're talking about tools and about of the, the sustainability aspect, um, it, it makes a, um, yeah, every individual building is a different case. So the, the tool setup is uh, um, pretty much uh, different depending on the type of project and depending on the type of outcome and what you really want to get at the end. The, the idea, I think, is having to do with, yeah, what kind of, uh, is, is this really mandatory for everyone to gather the necessary information till you get to the end of story knowing that you didn't cause a, a big burden on the environment within this tool process, that is the case. And again, maybe I don't want to repeat myself, but if there is a legislation that as an architect, as a team, you must do it, then the case will differ. It will not be um, just up to everyone making their own tool or way of reaching to the built environment, rather that there will be something that they have to, to include. Yeah, maybe another aspect is, uh how we can educate architects to be entrepreneurial uh, um, and 
entrepreneur and then uh, create jobs and like because this is something that maybe we don't um, usually typically do in architectural education but like we see a lot of examples at least uh, from my former students or like um, uh, other institutions that like there are spin-off companies which are like trying to like bring these technologies into the context of industry so I think there uh, with them we can expect a kind of a paradigm shift uh, um, and uh, back to your question, what would be the next big step, I think, is the way these, uh, I would say, bottom-up changes can, can change the landsca landscape of industry. I think that, um, no, yeah, that, that's totally true. But I mean, when you, when you see Nari talking about that next step, and I think on the previous one, Hannah was talking about the legislation, and I think, uh, what what do you what is the general perception? I mean, and I think for me it has been a very exciting moment since starting working with digital fabrication, like maybe 13 years, some time ago, but like kind of uh, some time ago, and seeing how it went to like from very very academic to really kind of start to see buildings being made with these technologies. I think is it has been incredibly exciting. I mean, to see like in 12, 13 years, right? Like from academia now, yeah, there are real buildings out there. But um, there is that step, right, into like, okay, we have all of these, now when we go to, to make them, and we have had that problem myself a lot, into now we have to get certified, and now we have to go through all of these steps to actually be competitive, let's say, with products that, that we know are maybe more inefficient or less sustainable, but that have been there for like ever, like that, that, that result in a, the, the buildings that haven't changed in a hundred years. Uh, do, do you have any idea of, of how, what, what, uh, how, what can we do, or how, or how is your own experience, for example, with the slab, with the the, 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 the empty slab, and this, into into going through that process of now getting this approved by an engineer that this uh, that this for a, for a building that is going to be for public use, let's say beyond just like the prototypes or pavilion or experimental areas. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm um, thinking more and more that also we have to, with all this certification and regulations, they, they are too too general. So our regulations working now for European Union with uh, uh, country-specific uh, issues, of course, but uh, as more as more you, you like to increase the scale of the regulations as more inefficient all the uh, the outcome is and uh, so I could imagine to, to go much more in the direction that you not just regulate materials and uh, processes but maybe really manufacturing steps maybe also design so uh, we could come more uh, in, in directions that um, for example, 3D printing is if you use those technology, you have to prepare the material in that way. And then if your structures or constructions outcome is in this way, for example, slabs. So you, re you re really regulated the whole process from design to fabrication for concrete slabs with ribs, what we are doing with this print on top, you know. And uh, this is a clear, not to start again each project, you start again to calculate slabs, you know. And uh, it's, it's stupid. It's not fun, it's uh, really stupid. And so this you could do in a much more holistic process. And uh, this is inspiring then, uh, start to... to and, and then maybe this is also a chance for new um, startups which take manufacturing, design, also this, for example, to, 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 to do slabs, con ribs, ribbed concrete slabs. Not just to use one technology or to do uh, generative design here. And so this could be a new market, so focus really on, on products, in, in, but maybe also then in a bigger scale, houses, I don't know. Yeah. But Important that as more you automate, this is important for us, but the outcome has to be really the potential for being customized to, to address to the location, and, uh, but this is possible. Yeah. Maybe I can add to this. Um, I think less than a week ago, I, I gave a speech in, in uh, TUM, in the Technical University of Munich, 
And I was asked directly when people heard the talk about alternative materials, structural engineers asked, okay, but how can we design with it structurally? We are only taught to, to design with concrete and steel. And I think one of the first steps in order talking about cooperation and creation, that also other related disciplines, pretty much the structural engineering as well as definitely architecture, that the, the education would have to include those technologies as a in the in the basic studies, like also engineers, structural engineers. I mean, a need to also have a bit of uh, idea of um, composites of lightweight structures in different ways and how to get through um, maybe the basic understanding of how to calculate those structures, so that at the end, if someone came up with the idea, okay, we need to um, now do it alternatively. It, it would not be struck out from the beginning before it really starts. And there will be enough disciplines, because this has been much of a challenge, to find also other colleagues from other disciplines who can work with these types of structure systems. The, I mean, education is one of the, the playing roles in it, plus, of course, the end of the story that was repeated a couple of times. Yeah, I, I fully agree. Uh, and. And still, we do to need to move um, the education in the engineering faculty. We have the, the traditional and historical uh, privilege of being teaching in both faculties. And we do see how the engineering academic studies are still way too analytical. And this is what it leads and way too uh, subdivided in a, in a very classical way into uh, materials and to, into processes. Uh, and they are not enough communicating to each other. So the one point is uh, to break that, because it's just not more what we need. The second thing is to, to educate engineering students not only to do analysis, but to do synthesis. And I do believe that this is not only something that has to be done in kind of design process in the architectural faculty. There, there is a long tradition for this. Um, but also we need a new generation of engineers which are more able to engage their creativity. And they do, to my, uh, to my understanding, too much mathematics at the beginning and they just kill their willing of uh, exploring new spaces and new dimensions. So this is one, uh, one part of it. And um, the second part of it, once we educate uh, designers, and, I, and from now on, I don't, want to want, I don't want to distinguish between architects and engineers. Uh, once we educate designers, it is about having a political frame, a, a regulation frame, where we do support creativity. That means if you know how to solve a problem, I mean, this is a kind of complementary to what Arald was saying. The one direction is to have systems which are uh, where we know they're working, and the other thing is where we are not working in a system field, we have to uh, allow people that know how to solve issues, how to find solutions, to make that. We need uh, much more space for experimental building within the regulation. And there is a big discussion in Germany. Germany is overregulated, to my, um, for my feeling, but it's not the only one. And uh, if we want to have a quicker transfer, uh, we need to release a lot of the energies that are in, in all of us, in all of the system, by relying much more into responsibility. And this is the second part of that. So we can engage creativity if we are allowed to be responsible for what we design, no matter what is the field we are coming from. And coming, coming back to the comment from Harald concerning also the regulations and the allowances, so how to move from the pure academia to practice. So I think we experience this two ways. One is the short-term goal based on the existing legislative requirements. You already could still design the new processes and structures that still will fit into the existing codes. So that I think, for example, for lightweight concrete construction, it is possible to create, for example, ripped slabs, 
that are still be calculatable and will be approved to be built. That's the short term perspective. And then of course, when we talk about the new materials, we had this with one of the um, early experiments in graded concrete where we sprayed different mixtures within one component. So that's clearly 50 years perspective because just basically construction industry is too inertia is, is too far in, for the further approval. But then already now, if we start with the short term solutions, let's say the um, uh, single concrete type with the reinforcement is being approved, but still we already show this as a demonstrator for the future perspective, this could possibly already accelerate the further processes of acceptance. Let's say this is what is now uh, happening with the fiber reinforcements. They really already more than 10 years are trying to get into the approval as alternative reinforcement material compared to the reinforcing still. But if there would be no efforts of companies who are pushing into this direction or the clear need that it could give us slender cross sections, less material um, and, and further improvements in, including carbonation, that would be probably even not happen at all. But we already know that with a, a fiber reinforcement, it will happen very soon. So the new codes will be um, coming into real life. So I think that's very important to keep this short-term, long-term perspective for development. That's a very exciting to hear. That things are coming and legislation is changing. Um, shall we open for the questions? If anyone on the audience has any questions uh, for anyone on the panel. Hello, uh, okay. Thank you so much for the nice presentations. Um, I'm going to change the topic a little bit. Um, I have a question that um, it relates to context, and more specifically cultural context. Um, we have seen in Harold's presentation uh, the paradox about building more with less resources, but we also know that a lot of this construction is going to happen in the global south. And so much of the technology that we're showing here today is only accessible in the global north. So I, I wanted to hear maybe also about Alicia because you had a little bit of this experience of applying these new technologies in a different context. Um, yeah, I wanted to know your opinion and your experience in how to not alienate the, the people that you are applying these um, new technologies to and not to make it a, a top down. So the same way that we looked at materials bottom up, how can we also implement this in different contexts bottom up, and then have the real digital vernacular that we so much talk about. Thanks. This is a really um, important question. And um, we saw, I think, Sunny, in your presentation, the Boston Dynamics uh, robot doing uh, some screwing and so on. So this is, of course, an extreme uh, direction so that we uh, have all these uh, androids doing uh, manual work in the future. So we are really also have this experience now that you have really uh, observed the whole processes and in some steps it's much better to use human labor instead of program a robot. For example, if we have these rib, ribs which we print and then we need to, on a defined uh, layer to insert three rebars. So now you could imagine five meter long, 12 millimeters rebar. Program two robots putting this and uh, pick and place this on top. Makes no sense. So two people take this, it's a thing on two minutes and it's over, it's done. So with augmented reality, you get exactly the information where you put this, rebars and so this is a, a human machine collabor collaboration and then it's also depending on uh, what is the most cost, co cost expensive part is it the human labor is it the material this this can vary from country to country even if of course from the ecological point of view to save material is the best but sometimes if it is too too expensive it will not uh, get uh, introduced into into the industry so you have in countries where where you have more human labor for for a lower price it makes sense to adapt the processes so this is what is important not just go now everything has to be digitized so we have to re really select uh, the processes each step by step and decide from location to location 
also regionally could be uh, different, could be interesting. So the same kind of process, but let's say one or two steps are here done manually. This is possible. We have this experience where we are working on this, yeah. Is it working? I guess, yeah? Okay, so just to add on this, because um, taking for consideration that uh, when it is digital, that means it has to do with uh, the, the first part of the hemisphere and not, not has having something to do with the south. I mean, coming myself, like half of me from the south, um, it was intentionally that all the developments that we did and all the fabrication systems that we have applied, they are available on an international and global level. So if, if we're talking here that uh, since this is digital, then that it might seem to be uh, belonging to a certain region or culture. Um, I think it is the time since also in the communication um, um, tools, it was very clear that this uh, did not have uh, almost a limit to whatever. I mean, we see mobile phones everywhere. We see those level of digitalization in communication. So similarly, the digitalization in the building sector could come in whatever region it is, depending on the original uh, type of fabrication that could be globally found. And at least, I mean, for the developments that is shown from our side so far in the presentation, this was um, with conscious from the beginning uh, selected to be applied in any region, whatever it is, wherever it is. In terms of like for us, I'm very aligned with that uh, Harold was saying, like I think that we are maybe now, like after a lot of time, like in the position where we can better understanding, at least for our, from architects, right, into the, all the, the, the digital fabrication systems and the robotics to like kind of start to adapt them to be uh, more usable for, for everyone, right? And I think that for us, when we started the, I mean, the project of um, Circular Factory, one of the ideas was how can we capture a lot of these functions or most of the functions that will normally be done by a, by a large range of machines on a single machine that of course will be more flexible, will have, but also has a, a cost, right? There is a cost on doing this, like in terms of efficiencies, it's not as efficient and, it's, and it has a lot of problems. But the idea is to, to, make, the, to make it as amicable and as easy to use as possible and also to reduce the cost. And I think that is something that because we have the technology now, like even in our phones, right? You have like super uh, high resolution scanners that it only happens in the last two or three years that, that you can start to get this technology. It wasn't like that even five years ago. So in terms of materials, like in a lot of local materials, uh, for example, they are not with, even the, 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 the raw material is not the same precision than if you get material like from Canada or Germany. It's, it's very different. The, the material maybe is not precise, but now we can scan it. So now we can like actually adapt that into a process so that local materials could be used even if they are a bit more imperfect than, than in other places. So I think that, that really is, is, uh, is, a, is a very exciting point when we talk about how can we adapt these technologies to, 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 to the South or, or to, to, to other places. I think, and, and me, I mean also coming from a Latin American country, like there is so much craft, but and and we can leapfrog a lot of the regulatory environments that really constrain, um, like 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 the north, right? So I think that there is where really there is a big opportunity if we make the technologies adaptable and, and easy to use, and also engage with the local craft and with the local materials to really leapfrog what is happening right now. And I think that is, for me, that is very exciting possibility. So I don't think we should see it as a divide because it's really, we, we do have the tools available now to, to, to bridge it and to, and to go very far. So, uh, I mean, I, at least that has been our experience and, and it has been scary and, and a lot of things have been very stressful years, but I think that, that is exciting to see, to see how people get excited by the technology. We have visitors, we have tons of people asking us to come to use the machines, to learn. Like, like the excitement is, is, is really, really amazing and, and it's really fulfilling to see it and, and to provide a different opportunity. And I think that uh, like a few years ago when we were talking about robotic fabrication, we couldn't talk about it being actually able to produce a different opportunity for people that maybe otherwise will be immigrating or will be do other realities, right? Now we see them at our door and it's like, wow, I mean, this is really what, what we want to do. So I think that it is really, it's, it's more the moment that has come together with uh, 
how we have engaged the, the simulation tools, the fabrication tools, and the technology, and the technological advances that have really progressed, with, and, and it's just engaging with our fabrication constraints. So, uh, yeah, I think it's a very exciting moment in that end that, that should not be separated or divided by, by kind of ideology. Yeah, maybe I can also add, like, I don't think, like, um, technologies are um, um, for specific nations, especially in today's world. Even like back uh, 2,000 years ago, like materials were traveling from one part of the world to, to build a structure in some other part of the world, right? So, and then this, is, this has changed, uh, and then new forms of technologies are uh, traveling. Uh, so you can also claim that like, it's not top down necessarily, like it's uh, a part of like uh, the whole Achievement of humanity, so like it's more accessible now, and then with the open source culture, this 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 is even more accessible. Um, um, and I think, um, yeah, customizing the the workflows to to different contexts is, I think, a very important uh, task of us now. Uh, really, tailor mating a specific workflow for a specific context according to the available technological and human resource, uh, uh, um, uh, human resources that we have. Like it was also in the presentation of Harold, like uh, lack of skilled workers, right? So like the skill sets of um, uh, people in different regions are different. And then how we can customize our um, computational or um, robotic production, robotic fabrication workflows to that skill set is I think uh, as part of the future. Other questions? Thank you very much for giving us, um, I would say, a picture of the present of your researches, um, which somehow represent the future for um, a lot of us, uh, just because um, we as uh, people uh, who don't work in the specific fields, we relate uh, this technology to the more standard ones uh, of construction. So uh, I'm curious to know uh, what is future in your idea? Um, how far do you imagine this uh, digital technology uh, can go? And um, how far would you like them to go? So somehow, if you have any dream cases about your researches, knowing that, of course, um, it also depends on the, on the process and on the uh, researches that uh, the results that your researches can can do uh, can give but yes if you have any dream cases that uh, you would like to tell us all right I can start with my dreams um, so as an architect as I mentioned before, I really had a lot of fun with engaging with materials and seeing how a lot of the processes and real environment actually happen in front of your eyes. You could just like guide them and try to understand them better. Um, what we achieved so far with our concrete research, I would like in the future more merge with the material research. So let's say to get not only engineered structures with the materials that are present now on the market, but more go with the engineered materials, because I think that we could go uh, further with that. So that's one of my dreams. So my, my uh, future idea is that we uh, can reach this global impact by more regional uh, strengthening. So that means uh, we are all used to globalization to produce somewhere our products and transport them here and there. And we start more, more and more to introduce change uh, locally, regionally. For example, with this robotic rammed earth, which I didn't uh, show in detail, this is depending on earth material. And so how our industry is organized uh, in Germany, and I think also here in other countries. So of course there is, you can get standardized, regulated material, uh, which you, in some region of Germany, which is produced. 
and you can buy this and then you ship these hundreds of kilometers through the country on this side and that side. Uh, so if you have a material like earth material which has no, no CO2 footprint, then it gets into your CO2 footprint by transportation. So why not use the material which is there locally? And to, to use this material, you have to start with the implementation there. So you have to qualify the material, you have to find new, new ways how to get processes of, of qualifying, which you can use everywhere, but maybe the, let's say, the, the, the specific um, regulation is regionally because this material here is maybe a little bit better, the clay here, and so the compressive strength is, if you take the clay exactly from this region, but you can, you can define this. So this is the outcome if you locally use this material, you compone it in this way, and then you use the robotic process. This is the same everywhere, but the material is locally. So this is my vision, uh, for example, to, to deal to really, and then this strengthens also the, the people working with the material, so the local industry gets inspired, you know. And also, uh, you can go in the next scale to, to uh, for example, to, to look to structures or houses out of earth material. And uh, so, we had in the past uh, this, what is it in English, uh, Bauhütten uh, building, construction huts, I don't know. So this was uh, teams of, of, of not just uh, building masters, but also uh, of all the manufacturers. And they went from location to location because they had the knowledge, you know. And uh, I mean, this is maybe not the future again, but uh, to strengthen really regional um, composition of what kind, what is the typical local materiality, what construction companies they should learn to deal with this material, and the digital uh, process, digital tools, they could be all over the, the same, you know. Yeah, I would like to also echo with this idea of distributed system. Maybe Fab Labs uh, were promising this, uh, let's say, um, change in uh, production, but like the impact of Fab Labs, Fab Labs very much, uh, uh, very, very much about like industrial design and product design. I think in the scale of architecture, um, if we could have a distributed system that could act locally, like the way our colleagues were saying, I think this would be a uh, an impactful, let's say, change. And I think in 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 architecture and building in building industry, if you want to have an impact. We need to either like look into like large problems or large scale buildings, like uh, for instance, um, was in the first presentation by Bruno and Daria, where they were looking into kind of a large scale uh, public buildings. So the way we may address digital fabrication is, uh, my in my opinion, is fundamentally different. The way we can address digital fabrication in the scale of a house, because in the house we have a small problem, but in large quantities. Right, it's fundamentally different, and in, in in that case, I think having distributed systems could like which can uh, act locally would be definitely an interesting invest, uh, let's say investment. But like back to your question, personally, I think yeah, I, I think we can also imagine that each of us could have some sort of a robotic building <coughs> pet, if you want want to call it that way, that can like. Um, um, operate and build in um, small scale, especially like th think of small problems but in large quantities because like housing is the problem of everyone but like public buildings is different. I think for that we may need other modalities of construction. So I would uh, then continue on that. My dream is about accelerating the transformation. It is about uh, talking about years and maximum about decades, but not uh, saying in 100 years what we are building now or what we are renovating now is more or less the same what it was done 100 years ago or 
even worse than that. I mean, that would be really uh, the, the worst thing that could happen to us. But the point is, in making this transformation visible, uh, it is more about the process and not that much about the result, the architectural result of it. So it's not about creating a new architectural digital style, uh, but it's more uh, creating a digital frame to engage different culture, different contexts. Are we talking about uh, existing urban context? Are we talking about new areas? I mean, the, the frame is totally different working with, with different materials, um, but the point is do it quickly and, um, and get the kind of trust in the future. I mean, you've been mentioning the, the, the word future a couple of times, which you think it's good. Uh, I do like to talk about future-proof architecture, so an architecture which is standing and uh, which is aware about, about its footprint, which is uh, looking forward and not uh, getting scared about what the future can, can bring. We do have the energies to, to face and to approach that. We have to engage them. Let me make a short note um, to this. Um, it's all about processes. So I showed this 20 years ago, his experiences on the freeform architecture. Architectural projects. Mm. And uh, so in that time, this was everything was that new that we could uh, not just uh, create new designs, but also to to um, do the the, the three-dimensional planning with software like Katia. So that, and this was based on really individual ideas of of architects. So what 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 are the borderings? What are the limits of what kind of design we could get into realization? And uh, now we are really looking. To, to, like you said, two processes. So we have to set up processes uh, which work in that way that the outcome still will be individualized and that we have our creativity at the end like we want to have. But we have to find new ways how the process steps are really controlled in a, let's say, in an efficient way, uh, reflecting all the other issues of um, economy, ecology, and also uh, social issues, yeah. Damn it. I will find an input to, to this exact point. Um, exactly the, the economic, I mean, personal uh, hope that the economic side of those uh, application possibilities would be quickly, very quickly reached to, to reach the market in the most uh, comprehensive way. Because at the end of the day, any consumer or any user whenever they see something that is nice to have, but then uh, if, if this is not meeting the expected uh, prices, at least with in comparison with the existing solutions, then, then here is also another aspect or side of the story. Plus definitely the legislation again, because in the, the global south, which is pretty much linked to the previous question, if, if even this is reached to the correct price, but um, then there, are, there is like no rule allowing to apply this type of application in that local region, then there is a problem. Like for instance, clay, clay is not allowed to build with anymore in Egypt, for instance, for, for a specific regional, um, no, no, not anymore because of the richness of earth, because there is a problem in agriculture, so one is linked to the other, yes. And, and in every region, what is here suitable is not suitable in the other region, but also price-wise, but at the end of the day, they keep using concrete, like here in, in Europe, like everywhere. So, I mean, at the end, even if we are uh, promoting a, a solution which is pretty much payable, but in certain locations that's not suitable, while in other, even pretty much the same locations, other types of totally un, um, un, unhealthy even ways of production of concrete, which is the case again in Egypt, that it causes a lot of um, very fine dust, which has a problem then causing many uh, lung diseases. So it's one is really against the other, so it's, there are so many things that we really hope to change. We have time for like uh, one last question, a quick one, before, uh, yeah. Well, maybe it's more um, a comment than a question. Being one of the, the pioneers of the digital architecture in the 90s, I worked with Harald, um, 
we did have the ambition to create a new form as well, that new possibilities in production will generate new and different forms for different problems as well. And what I do see in the last biennales for the last 10 years is that there's a lack of interest in, in form. And I see it in my students as well. And I still have the ambition that all these technologies will come up with a different kind of architectural uh, form. I think that's a very a beautiful comment, actually. Like we need to engage back to form and design. And um, yeah, so thank you very much for everyone in the panel today. It was, was very, very uh, like inspiring. I, I really feel very good after this panel. And thank you very much for everyone. I think we are going to uh, wrap it up now. Yeah. Thank you so much, Alicia. Thank you so much for sharing with us uh, your research, your work, and not only through the conversation today, but also through the exhibition and the project that you have in the, in the gardens and in Palazzo Mora, for instance. We, we heard a lot about uh, education, about like, changing the mindset, and showing the alternative construction methods to a broader audience. So we hope that also through the work that we do and uh, Presenting it through a broader audience, we can see it more and more over the years, and then become become more like normal, let's say, to um, to, to to share about. So, uh, with that, uh, I'd like to uh, thank everybody again, and to um, see you in uh, one hour at two uh, past two for the closing part of the conference. So, thanks again. <laughs>